So, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start our webinar. I hope that you can hear me. Yes. That sounds good. Okay, then. So then let me welcome you all to this WWEA webinar on education and training for wind power and renewable energy. A very good morning, good day, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are. I'm very glad that we have people from around the globe joining us. And it's a very good way again to reconnect. Uh, it's a great pleasure that we have several partner organizations with which we are um, co-hosting this webinar, which I think is about an important topic. Um, in particular, UNIDO, the African Platform for Community Power and Rural Education, the Chinese Wind Energy Association, the International Renewable Energy Academy, which is hosted by York University, and the Danish Folke Center. So let me, just before we start with the, uh, the formal welcome addresses, inform you a little bit about how this webinar is working. Um, so we would request everybody who is not speaking, who is not a speaker to stay muted in order to avoid, of course, disturbing sounds, background noise. So please stay muted until it's your turn to speak either the speakers or of course, if we have time for discussion, also the Q and A sessions. If you have any questions, please in particular make use of the chat window. Everybody can write questions here. Um, that is uh, of course an option and then we can come back to your questions. I would also like to mention that this is a public event. So we will record this webinar and later publish it on our channels. It will be publicly available, um, each of the presentations, which is of course a good way that you can also check your um, the presentations and watch them again. But please be aware that whatever you say, if you raise your voice, if you say something, it's going to be recorded and other people will be able to listen, not only now, but also later. Uh, last but not least, uh, let me mention also again, great thank you to everybody who is involved in this, in particular our co-hosts and also to our partner here, uh, Profit Ventus, who is supporting us so that we can have these webinars running, which are free uh, um, at no cost. Um, of course, if you want to support our activities, there's a different ways of doing it. Um, joining WWA, we are always happy having new members from around the world joining our network, and we have a range of sponsorship options for uh, these webinars, which are of course relevant for uh, companies in particular. So this is a kind of introduction. With this, I would like to hand over to the president of the World Wind Energy Association, Peter Ray. Peter, you are um, joining us from Tasmania, from Australia. Peter. Well, hello to everybody. Uh, as uh, Stefan has said, it's various times of the day for each of us, but this is a time when we can talk about education because that's something which is 24 hours a day anyway. It needs to be. As the world has uh, seen the development of the wind industry, has seen something which has in the past 25 or 30 years gone from being an immature and developing industry to something which is an important part of the whole world today. That it has touched uh, virtually every part of the world. And as it's become more extended and further developed, the need for education, the need for teaching and uh, for development of design and development of new ideas, as well as how to carry out the existing ideas has become extremely important. And so, I believe, and I think we would all believe, that tonight's uh, webinar will fulfill a very important function. And I'd like to thank and congratulate those uh, who have been behind the development of uh, ideas for education systems. And that includes our old friend and former um, 
the former uh, president, uh, Hid Exon, who I welcomed this evening uh, to this, uh, well, today to this uh, webinar. Uh, there are others too many to mention, but I'll just pick uh, him in particular uh, as somebody who has uh, played an important role and has been a president of our association, a very much appreciated president. Thank you very much for the opportunity to open this uh, webinar, and I now hand back to Stefan to uh, introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks so much, and uh, great to have you from uh, joining from Australia here. Um, now, as all of our partners are going to speak, and otherwise we have a very long list, I would request now everyone to also welcome the people when you start speaking. I would just like one exemption, and this is uh, Professor Hidik Sin from the Chinese Wind Energy Association, as China is represented here well with three presentations. But Professor He, you do not have a, um, a speech yourself, and we, we are very happy, as Peter Reyes already mentioned, to have you here on board. And I would uh, request you also to welcome the participants. Yes, now we can uh, hear you. Dear President uh, Peter Ring, dear Secretary uh, uh, Professor Stephen, <coughs> uh, dear guests, firstly, on behalf of Chinese Wing Energy Association, thanks for your attending this for the webinar education and training for wind power. We are much honored to co-organize this webinar. With the rapid development of the global wind energy industry, effective and high quality education and training is becoming more and more demanding. Talents uh, as the foundation and the Fundamental productivity play a key role in economic development. Wind energy industry is a high tech industry. We must clearly and correctly understand the importance of talent, education, and training. At the same time, under the environment of world economic integration, Sharing advanced technology is an important way to carry out the quality education and training. In the future, we should strengthen international cooperation and exchange, exploit the way of talent training with industry characteristics. Jointly promotes the development of talent training in wind power industry. Thanks for your attention. That's all. Thank you so much, Professor He. It's a great pleasure to see you again. Um, and again, it's, I think this is an excellent opportunity to meet, uh, although we are quite far away. And uh, our, all our greetings to Beijing. Now, uh, let me start with the speakers. And as I said, we have uh, all these partners here with us. Um, I would like now to start with uh, uh, Dr. Osman Benchik, who used to be responsible at UNESCO for uh, renewable energy. So he is uh, one of the experts, global experts for renewable energy and in particular training education. Um, um, Osman, we have spoken a lot in the past about the importance of training in education. We have exchanged our views and having this uh, webinar here is next to, of course, also an initiative coming from China and other uh, conversations goes a lot back to the activities that you're doing. So I would like to ask you to welcome the participants and also give your input into our discussion here and uh, start with the webinar. Osman. <coughs> Thank you very much, Stefan. Do you hear me well? Is it okay? Yes. Um, <clears throat> good morning, good evening to everyone. And uh, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, please allow me just to thank our friend, Stefan, for initiating this uh, webinar on education, which is, from my point of view, one of the key issue uh, should we have to really move ahead with, uh, with the uh, 
a higher share of renewables within the energy mix. So we need the engineers, we need technicians, we need researchers and so on. So the importance of education is really key for the development of renewable energy issues, but in general for the life. So uh, I really thank all those who are taking part to this, uh, to this webinar and also to the different uh, contributors who are all mainly uh, involved in uh, somehow in the uh, education and training. And um, without uh, waiting, if you may, I maybe need to um, go directly to go to the presentation uh, to introduce the, uh, the subject. So the capacity building and knowledge base, the challenges and perspectives. But let me first start by energy as critical issue. We have energy, I mean, we have very low consumption in the developing countries. If we look to the energy as such, it's strongly correlated with the human development indicators. In the developing countries, we have to expand electricity infrastructure three to four times just to reach the SDG basic needs. And uh, we have uh, roughly 15% of the world population, which represents more than 1 billion that still lack access to electricity. Um, Unfortunately, Osman, in Africa. Excuse me. Yes. D did you want to show your slides? Because yes. we do not see your sh screen yet. Oh, I was sharing it. It's not yet. Okay. Appearing so, here. So let me get back again. Yes, now it starts. You got here it. Here we are. Yes, if you just go to presentation mode, then we see the slide only that you want to share. Is it okay? Perfect, yes. Yes, please go ahead. Perfect. So I guess that uh, I have not to, to get back to what I was saying, if you are hearing me. Now, uh, I will just go back to the fact that we have still 15% of the world population, which is somehow more than 1 billion that lack access to uh, electricity. And uh, the high impact, and this is something that I would like to zoom on, the high impact on the quality education, uh, when uh, I mean the access to electricity on the uh, quality education. We unfortunately, we do still have one third of the children in the developing countries that still go to schools without uh, electricity. And this, is a, this represents more than 100. Uh, 80 million. <clears throat> Before going to the issue of um, education as such, let me just highlight, highlight let's say, the uh, potential of the renewable energy sources in general. Um, we have here the solar potential all over the different regions of the world, but I will personally zoom now on the Africa region and um, see that we have in that part of the world very, very high potential of solar, but it's the same exactly for, for wind energy and for thermal and biomass, etc. I mean, for the different forms, but for the to save time, I just try to zoom on one of the renewable energy forms and see that we have a high potential. Unfortunately, if we take the same world map and, um, and, and, and look to the uh, solar, uh, uh, I mean the uh, infrastructures for science, technology and innovation, or let's say the teaching, the education and teaching institution in the different part of the world, we see that 
that part of the world which is blessed with solar energy, which is Africa, it's the region that has the lowest rate, almost, I mean, nothing in terms of infrastructure for edu education, uh, science, and technology. And if you go to Europe with, let's say, less need to access to electricity as they do have, I mean, it's almost 100% with, uh, with access, they have uh, um, a higher number of infrastructures. And from my point of view, this is a paradigm that we absolutely need to, to change. Uh, and we have to move ahead to get, if we talk about global access to electricity, we have also to talk about global access to education and the training, as well as science and technology institutions. This will also help in addressing, let's say, the creation of jobs as if we take a scenario, and I made some calculations some time ago, on if we go ahead with 100% rural electrification using renewables, we have somehow, at least in that part of the world, Africa, but in other regions as well, in South A East Asia and South Asia is even higher, we have more than two million and a half jobs in that part of the world. In South Asia, it's almost three million jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, the education and the training, it's really important, not only in terms of science and technology, but also in terms of job creation. And we, from my point of view, need to change the energy development paradigm that we have been witnessing until now, and how to do it by uh, mobilizing education, science, technology, and innovation. You have all heard about the different set of SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And now if we look to these goals, we see that all of them, they need contribution or uh, co contribution from the science and technology uh, sector. Science in its broader understanding and science and technology and innovation play a crucial role for a sustainable development. If we take the science, technology and innovation, <coughs> it's in fact the most critical means of implementation of the entire set of SDGs. And the, all the goals, all the different goals in the, the, in the new uh, agenda we require input from scientists as well from engineers. Implementing the 230 uh, uh, agenda must be based on an integrated scientific approach grounded in the best available knowledge. The new development agenda recognizes, by the way, the need to mobilize STI, science, technology, and innovation at a global scale and across the different disciplines to lay the foundation for practices, innovations, and technologies needed to address the global challenges of today and in the future. What are the main challenges in terms of science, technology, and innovation and education? Further efforts are needed in the several uh, renewable energy technologies like PV, wind, uh, fuels, other renewable energy sources, fuel cells, storage systems, hydrogen, carbon sequestrations, uh, etc. More emphasis on end use technologies with high, with high energy saving should be made, and also opening a new research area in harnessing, harnessing renewable energy flows. Science education on energy should be widely developed particularly in the developing countries. Relevance of decentralized systems of grid to ensure affordable electrification, particularly in developing countries. You see that these challenges cannot be sorted out unless the education, science, and technology are seriously tackled. What need to be, what need to do, what we need to do. And in that sense, we have 
worked on a, a global initiative because from my point of view to sort out global issues, we need global initiative. What are the main, why, why, why the education matters? Um, Sorry, just a second, I'm having some problems here. Anyway, uh, training the human resources is the main pillar for the energy development shift and the, the, the deriving energy diver, diversification and supplies. And expect, expanding the technological leapfrogging is in fact key in addressing the energy challenges. We will not meet 100% access to electricity in the developing countries, particularly in Africa and Southeast Asia, unless we expand the technology leapfrogging. We have not to reinvent the wheel. The local and human development, uh, the local and the human and institutional capacities is really vital for the management of energy strategy and adaptation of renewable energy technologies to local needs and priorities. Indeed, we have technologies, but we need to adapt case by case these technologies to the local priorities and, uh, and needs. And the priorities and needs in Africa are different from those in Asia and different from those in, in, in Australia or in Europe, etc. Wide access to renewable energy science and technology by all nations is essential for a global sustainability. We cannot reach a global sustainability unless we have a global access to science and technology. Global solutions will be only possible, will be possible only through global initiatives involving the different stakeholders in both developed and developing countries. And this is the reason why we have launched this global initiative, because to tackle global solutions, you need global initiatives. What is the main strategy for the launched initiative? It's a human and institutional capacity building, the dissemination of scientific knowledge and technology, advocacy for technological leapfrogging, I was talking about, and scientific exchange, and also mobilize an effective international partnership to provide policy advice and definition of renewable energy strategies, to support innovative technologies to enhance field knowledge, and to develop training tools and materials, and also to promote the best practices to avoid unnecessary loss of time and duplication. What would be the main target of such a global initiative on education? It's the education sector in general, from the researchers to lecturers, professors at college, etc., the in-service personnel, the technical services, technicians, project managers, technical staff, etc., Policy and administration, and this is most of the time something which is missed. The policy and decision makers are most of the time not really aware about some technical issues. And even when we talk about renewables, what could be the potential, what could be the need, etc., etc. So I do believe that if not a training, but at least a briefing targeting the policy makers and decision makers should be made as well as to local authorities. So for me, it's really important to have such uh, a segment uh, of uh, uh, potential targets, the policy and administration. And of course, the end users and operative in the field, they have also to understand or to have uh, an idea about the equipment, at least for the uh, basic maintenance. And finally, the, uh, the entrepreneurs, from the production to the installation until the 
bluntness of the uh, of the sector. What are the main, uh, let's say, uh, issues for the fair way forward? I do believe, and uh, that we need to link the different agenda and have a comprehensive and holistic approach to energy science and technology, to climate, sustainable development, as well as to other SDGs. And this is one of our tasks, to see how we can link the different agendas in order to move ahead as all that are linked but in order to address a global issue, we need also to have a global strategy and link this agenda. The human and institutional capacity development are, from my point of view, a global a key driver to uh, uh, the global uh, sustainability and development. Technological leapfrogging, the renewable energy should be promoted and expanded and energy science, technology, and innovation is vital for the shift or the energy paradigm uh, uh, shift or change. The renewable energy skills and technologies must be shared and transferred. And this is, from my point of view, really a key issue. The regions, the world regions, there are who are the more interested by the use of renewables, at least in order to address the access to electricity, not talking about energy saving, etc., are those who lack the know-how and technologies. And we need to have a global and world solidarity, at least among institutions dealing with these universities, institutes, etc., and share the information and know-how. We also need to create regional alliances like South-South or North-South-South cooperation. And we need also to develop productive capacities to promote technological learning and innovation and reinforce key institutions as well as the development of science technology and technology infrastructure is crucial. And please allow me when talking about this uh, last point, which is part of the initiative, we have already, let's say, we are already initiating uh, in Africa what we call uh, uh, an African uh, university that deals with uh, the renewable energy issues. I do believe that we can have the same regional university at, uh, in, uh, in Asia and uh, maybe in Europe, etc and try to create a global network uh, uh, among institutions. And maybe these regional uh, networks can diffuse the information to other uh, regions. And finally, uh, uh, let me just conclude by uh, saying that um, uh, changing the energy development uh, uh, paradigm will be possible only if access to renewable energy science and technology as well as innovation are widely shared and made available for all in all nations. The technological leapfrogging is key in this regard in the developing countries. With this, I thank you for, for your attention and uh, I will be pleased to hear from you and see how best we can create a synergy and cooperation among the institutions where we are active and acting and this global initiative. And just to, I am pleased to inform you that we have already some governments who are really uh, interested by the initiative and supportive to this. And I do hope that we will very, very soon have, uh, um, uh, um, um, let's say, a, a, a huge movement towards this coalition for education and training. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Osman. You're kind of, uh, how to say, in media's list. So you started already our webinar with uh, 
the vision of having a great degree of international collaboration program. And we will now hear from, of course, our speakers, what they are already doing in the fields. Before we do that, we've now prepared some polls for all of you. And uh, I'd like to ask you some questions. And the first poll now is just very simple one. Um, just uh, if you have a look, um, are whether I think it's good to know whether those participants here, are you involved directly or indirectly in the education and training in uh, wind or renewable energy? So you should see this now um, on your screen and uh, encourage you to participate in the poll and uh, um, indicate whether you are um, yourself active in training and education. So it should now appear on your screen. So um, with that, I would uh, now invite our next speaker. It's a great pleasure having uh, Unido on board um, and uh, Rana Pradap Singh. You are joining us, I suppose, from Vienna, from the headquarters of UNIDO. Um, great pleasure having you, UNIDO, as a key UN organization for industrial development. And it is very obvious that industrial development now goes hand in hand on the one hand with renewable energy and that uh, training education is also a key component of industrial development. Um, Rana, it's a great pleasure welcoming you. If I may hand over to you and uh, request you also welcome the participants and then uh, present your views on the topic of our webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban. Thank you very much for accepting me in this group. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody participating in this group or indirectly even through the recorded message whosoever will be interested to learn from our experiences. Uh, this is a great initiative, WWEA, and uh, we all are sharing our knowledge experiences. So I would like to welcome all the attendees of today and of the future also. Uh, now I'm directly entering into my presentation. Um, sorry, mm, share a screen and then. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen, is it is it appearing? Not yet. No. Uh, okay. So, okay. Yes, now it's coming. Excellent. Okay. So uh, after listening, uh, listening the first presentation, uh, my presentation is also going in the same line. Uh, I would like to share my experiences, how UNIDO is uh, performing in the field in real world what is the meaning of training and education for renewable energy? Uh, what are our experiences from different parts of the world? I will briefly like to touch uh, on this kind of thing. So basically, UNIDO is coordinating international capacity building, uh, not only for energy access, but our main motive is how to support industrial development. It means even with a small, a small amount of energy access to renewable energy, decentralized or maybe green, uh, uh, sorry, grid-based, whatever way, our final target is to really support SMEs or uh, whatever kind of uh, industrial activities. Uh, so this is uh, our main aim, being industrial organization. And uh, in this regard, I would like to recap my previous uh, um, presentation at several places where we are saying that any kind of transformation needs to pass through different stages. As you can see, in this case, uh, renewable energy transition, uh, let us assume that a country has very minimal kind of capacity, very low level of electrification, very low level of educational status, but ultimately they want to be very, very rich in energy access or energy for industries. And 
Of course, they want to make it a sustainable energy availability throughout the country. So these are the two ends. One is from the very, very basic infrastructure, even if it is not existing, on the final, it will have sufficient amount of sustainable energy for its all round developmental support. So in this case, what I would like to say when our previous speaker was also mentioning his experiences from different places, uh, uh, really Africa and many part of other world like Latin America some of the countries and Asia uh, also in several countries and Central Asia. Uh, we have noticed that energy access is a big problem. So many people are not really having energy and that is also stopping their overall development. So in this regard, when we go to the country and to uh, want to train the people, want to enhance their capacity for renewable energy expansion, uh, it is very, very important to notice that theoretically teaching at university level or laboratory level is not sufficient. They need something really to experience. So UNIDO has a methodology under the capacity building, what we say it learning by doing. And all you can say, what we want to do is, we want to involve the trainees, involve the partners, who will be functioning at different level. As in the previous uh, presentation, of, uh, UNESCO was sharing that whenever we want to train or capacitate the people, uh, maybe technically, maybe from the decision maker point of view. So there are different layers, different level, different kind of a stakeholder who need such kind of capacity building training, whatever we want to do, we want to perform because reforms are theoretically done on uh, analysis on data gap collection and also learning from the best practices all around the world. And all those kind of theoretical things translate into reforms recommended for the country. But how to perform it? That is a big question and in that perspective, as I said, in Africa, Central Asia, Asia, and some part of Latin America, when we try to uh, do this kind of uh, capacity building, then we realize, okay, people are very happy to learn the classroom kind of thing, but when it need to translate into the field, their uh, meaning of capacity building needs many, many intelligent way to involve them. And that's why UNIDO has developed a mechanism of hand holding. It means either you are analyzing it or you are modeling it or you are implementing, executing, whatever you are doing, you will be present with the trainees or the counterparts throughout the cycle. And that's how we, we perform this kind of thing. To do it, UNIDO uh, use its international network scattered throughout the world. We have 25, 26 centers uh, in, in different part of the world where from anybody can access UNIDO service. So it will be cost effective. And that is one of the uh, best way we are helping many countries. For instance, in Africa, we have uh, four or five centers. One is in East Africa, in, in Uganda, another is in uh, Cape Verde, and another is uh, in, in, in uh, Namibia, and, and uh, so many other kind of centers. In addition, as previous speaker was also indicating in the city kind of uh, element where we need to strengthen the knowledge and capacity, what we did at the university level, we identified uh, some of the university and uh, we established uh, uh, this research and development center where from a lot of the students are gaining, uh, I mean, uh, getting opportunity to really practice, to learn and, and also to contribute in this renewable energy expansion. One important thing I just want to tell you, uh, they are also, you need to very carefully uh, insisting uh, 
faculties and the student to perform in the field. It is not like that you are teaching in the class and then after it is gone. No, you have to bear in mind that whatever is taught in terms of academics, in terms of classroom teaching, you have to translate. And that's why earlier I was saying, when there is a reform recommended by uh, experts externally or maybe from the national consultation or whatsoever way, it has to perform. Because unless and until we perform, there is no question of transform. And we all are trying to make the complete transformation. So that's why Unido is well experienced and, and, and making this kind of trial in many countries. For instance, I can give you a, one example in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in Guinea, in Cameroon, we chose one one university and we established a, a small hydropower development center. And then in certain country, we also established some of the agencies who are uh, very hard working on the expansion of solar and expansion of biomass kind of technology in that country. And we have seen very good results. So uh, next, I just want to share with you one very important thing, whenever we are talking about capacity building, don't forget that we do not have sufficient money forever we can get some kind of support from donors, some kind of support from like-minded uh, uh, development partners, but it will be in a limited amount for limited uh, time period. So when we want to really make this sustainable transformation, then we have to realize that there should be a self-sustaining kind of condition. It means, it means that whenever we are talking about RE capacity building, RE in a sustainable achievement for uh, uh, final goal, we need to keep in mind that it should be financially attractive. In the beginning, if we can communicate, if we can make economically attractive, then there could be some kind of support from the government in different forms. There could be some kind of support coming from development partners, but Finally, the sector should be financially attractive so that the investor will come, private sector will come, and they will meet the huge demand in the country to, to invest in the energy sector expansion. But while we are talking about economics, dealing uh, at the final stage, financially viable and attractive solution, we should also keep in mind that it should be very much acceptable uh, with the environmental kind of uh, uh, conditions and also socially it should be acceptable. So there are some few, uh, few, few additional kind of thing we have to keep in mind that how inclusive it is, how it is looking in terms of gender kind of dimension. So these are some of the things we have to keep in mind. And finally, at the capacity building kind of uh, action and plan planning activity, we have to be very careful about demonstration. Demonstration, selection of demonstration sites, selection of demonstration technology, selection of demonstration scale, these are not a simple kind of thing that we can just pick up something. These, these need a lot of intelligent planning and by which if we select a proper demonstration, then it will lead to successful uh, lesson learning and successful in terms of replicating further. So in that way, we have to really educate the people how to perform this demonstration and how to educate and capacitate the country. Uh, uh, important point here we have to take into consideration, it is not like that you or me is always going there to make their capacity. Their capacity once is built it should be targeted to retain in the country and the country should take the leadership. So it means we have to avoid the dependence. We have to make the country self dependent on this kind of capacity, even though in the start, it may require additional support from outside, but ultimate goal should be to, 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 to let the country to stand on its own. 
So in that way, what we say, it is not a, a small piece solution kind of thing. It should be go, it should go in a programmatic way where we have to consider a large mass of the stakeholders interested in this capacity training building and from which there will be some active partners which will go upper on the layer and then finally some of them will evolve as a leader in the sector in that country and this approach is very much welcomed by many countries and we have seen some of the countries are doing very good uh, in this part earlier there were very good interest and now they are completely uh, commanding this renewable energy up to a scale i don't say that it is for every scale, but whatever they targeted, they achieved and their self, I mean, uh, country-based leaders are leading the renewable energy expansion. In this regard, uh, previous speaker also mentioned that South-South cooperation and North-South cooperation, that is a very important approach because when we want to um, uh, share our knowledge and experiences, it should not be uh, from a very high to very low level kind of transition. Otherwise, there is a chances that the knowledge transfer will crash. So there should be a, a focus what you are or what we are trying to educate them, what we want to enhance their capacity should be acceptable to the recipient, uh, stakeholder or recipient country also. It means what? if there is a likelihood of transferring experiences from a much similar kind of context, that is social context, environmental context, and technical capability context kind of thing, educational background similarity, and some, some kind of uh, communication, uh, effective communication among those countries, then it will be very much easier for this capacity building to go further. In this regard, South-South cooperation is a very good kind of um, uh, experience. And fortunately, UNIDO is uh, one of the pioneer organization in the South-South cooperation. And every year, you can see some of the contribution is identified as best examples or best replicable project practice um, uh, recommended and, and done by uh, UNIDO. So I was also one of the very lucky person to get every volume. So far, South-South Cooperation from New York UN office had published three volumes. And in each volume, fortunately, one one of my project was also identified as best replicable project and you can access it. So the South-South Cooperation is very effective. But it doesn't mean that North-South is not meaningful. North-South is also meaningful, but we have to keep in mind how much we want to transfer and to whom we want to transfer. There should be a, a possibility to match together. Uh, one example I can tell you, nowadays we are talking about digitization. And digitization is really very good, but digitization in a simple way, if it is acceptable and manageable by the counterpart in an easy way for this transfer of renewable energy technology, it is good. But if we want to make a very highly integrated and sophisticated kind of data transfer and auto system where iCloud and other things are required, but the, unfortunately in those countries, if the internet and access of this data and transparency are the big challenge, then there will be no, no transfer of uh, is no transfer of technology. So your capacity building training and everything will fail finally. So we have to take into consideration when we transfer from one to another, there should be a matching kind of recipient uh, capacity with whatever technology and the things we are. Uh, if I may just ask you to keep in mind the time. Oh, okay, so now now I, I'm practically done. I'm just sharing some of the examples okay. what we have done in terms of training of local technician. You can see how we practically do and we have established a, a practical field where many people are coming and, and, and continuously throughout the year they are, they are getting trained in solar installation and the country capacity has grown very much and they are performing very well. So in, in, in this example, example the similar kind of thing you can you can see the people are performing uh, in the field and uh, uh, under the instruction of the university professor so this is a very low technology kind of installation 
capacity building, but it is done through the university faculties so that there should be a clear cut knowledge transfer, how to make such kind of installation without failure. Uh, this is the example to sustain the system, there should be an income. And as we are the industrial organization, we need to bring some kind of productive use and business and SMEs. And you can see the same university professor is helping them how to run the business and very simple system and very, uh, I mean, uh, low energy consuming kind of business and enterprise we have helped to establish them. Then when we talk about South-South cooperation, you can see many participants are going and it is now you can see the level of not only South-South, it could be also a North-South kind of uh, situation that uh, from China, uh, several of the countries are getting very good knowledge about how hydropower technology manufacturing and things exist in the world. So this is all our experiences. And at the end, I, I must say that this is a good opportunity, this kind of uh, floor. Uh, we can exchange our views and, and experiences to make uh, training and capacity building in the renewable energy sector and wind sector very effective. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. That was an excellent overview of what you're doing and how important your role is. And I think in, in particular, touching these aspects of which type of collaboration models already exist. And uh, we'll come back uh, to you. Um, so thanks again. Uh, and and uh, well, great pleasure having Yonido on board as really one of the key players in all this. Now, uh, Sean, do we have the results of this first poll which can be shown? If so, I obviously it's on, not working on my computer. Um, otherwise, let me go to then our next speakers. And it's a great pleasure, as I mentioned already initially, that we have uh, three speakers here from China. Now, after we heard more the global overview uh, and the vision, um, we have uh, uh, three speakers who will speak from a very practical uh, uh, perspective. And it's a great pleasure to have here Mr. And I'm sorry for not pronouncing the name correctly. Mr. He Shi Yong from Goldwind. He is in charge of human resource development at Goldwind. And uh, Goldwind, as most of you will know, one of the world's largest, China's largest wind turbine manufacturer who has always been uh, also um, had a very sp a strong focus on development of human resources. Uh, Mr. He, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Stefan, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to join this forum today. Um, it's a great uh, opportunity to learn from different perspectives, especially the previous two uh, speakers on the global scale, the industry-wide uh, observations, and now, uh, I'd like to share a little bit about um, uh, what we do uh, at, as a company uh, in terms of talent uh, training and development. Um, so I uh, think, how do I share? Okay. That looks good. If you just now go to the presentation mode, then I think it's perfect. Okay. Perfect. Yes. All right. So I would just jump into um, so Goldwind um, is a relatively young uh, company in the industry, uh, about 21 years uh, since we incorporated. Uh, so we are very proud of participation in the wind industry, uh, the green energy. Um, it, is, it is great, but uh, at the same time, we realize uh, people are at the heart of our uh, industry as well. So uh, it is great industry, uh, solar, wind, but also it has challenges. It has hardship uh, associated with the industry as well. So our motto is uh, creating values and achieving successful lives. So that means we not only focus on providing the best of wind turbines and creative values for our customers, but also the people 
serving the industry should also get the attention that we can win the industry altogether. So that means we uh, equip people with the necessary uh, skills, uh, pay attention to the safety and wellness uh, to the people uh, involved, and also do the good things to environment and safeguard our uh, uh, communities. Uh, just a little bit about what we think about when talent training, we always starting from the left hand, what is the job required for the people to be successful? What are the standard content method and risk assessment associated with a job analysis, as well as law and the legal legis uh, reg legislation requirement, which are many uh, for good reason uh, to help people uh, to uh, uh, stay away from the herd and the uh, industrial hazard. Uh, from the red hand, we uh, always need to consider how do we un uh, unite, uh, unite the knowledge, skill, and practice so that people can perform the job um, adequately and sufficiently. Uh, also keep improving as environment change uh, to add in new skills and uh, uh, fill in the gaps. So HSE is a huge part in terms of uh, wind industry. So we think about all the stakeholders involved, including the top leadership, what's the role and, and the responsibility uh, for top leaders, for managers, and also the wind project, special requirement and uh, special operations associated with uh, legal legislation requirement three level safety requirement and the customized situation given each unique situation of the uh, projects. Uh, this chart shows a uh, general framework when we think about enable people's progress when they get into the industry, they need have fundamental and which important the sea survival, work at height, uh, low voltage electrician, all this kind of requirements. This is a must for people to get into the job. And then we need to uh, provide uh, systematic uh, technological uh, skills uh, progression, you know, starting from basic technical skills like uh, elect electricity, hydraulic, mechanicals, and then when we involve, we need the project management, uh, the uh, more complex uh, technical situation handling. And for management, uh, how do you enable the team uh, and uh, building stronger uh, execution capability to finish the project in time, on budget and deliver the required return for our customers. So that's a lot uh, behind each of the module, but basically uh, it's continued enabling and uh, uh, improvement for the people to get the job done, uh, involving our technology, moving to the next le uh, level of height and uh, reducing the cost uh, of, the, of the projects. Uh, this is one uh, small case uh, sharing I want to um, offer to the audience here today, uh, especially uh, given the uh, complexity of regulations and the safety environment standard. So when we go into the offshore projects, uh, we will have to uh, apply the Maritime Safety Agency uh, regulations. We, in Goldwyn, we establish our training facilities that can simulate the sea survival challenges. You know, the waves, the storm, the thunder, uh, all these kind of challenges and people should familiarize themselves with um, the necessary skills and the use of uh, the equipment that can get away from that uh, hazardous uh, situation. The first aid, CPR, firefighting and standard test. So those are necessary. We have four uh, certificates. 
that require for people to get over uh, on a ship on a boat to get on the offshore projects. So that is uh, that is one part. And the next part is uh, emergency management agency requirement in China. So necessary, basically the two uh, certificates. One is work from height. You need to pass to the practice and test uh, to get a certificate on that uh, certificate so, so that you can be allowed to climb on the wind turbine uh, to perform the job. The other requirement, the minimum requirement is the low voltage uh, electrician certificate. So that is uh, necessary um, to, uh, to, uh, for everyone in the field work. Uh, we also have a requirement, mandatory requirement for management teams um, in charge of the project to pass on the training on safety roles and safety leadership requirement for the people uh, in, the, uh, in charge of the project. Uh, the last part is the uh, basic uh, technical training. We uh, partner with GWO and we launched the first GWO certified training center in China. So basically with this uh, element in place, we have all three requirements satisfied for all the people uh, that need to go on the offshore, the onshore project. So that is what we call MSA plus EMA plus GWO one-stop training solutions. So with this uh, uh, capability in place and facility established, we are able to uh, provide the training for, to satisfy all of the um, technical safety environment requirement um, certification uh, for people get into uh, the industry, not only for ourselves, but, but also for, um, for our project owners and for um, people, for third party service companies participating in, in the industry. So this year we further uh, enhance our capability. So we uh, had the, the first mobile uh, basic technical training uh, platform. So that is a way we can bring the basic necessary training um, to our um, projects as well as to our customers uh, with mobile capability. So not limited by the geography location of our training center, but also to provide the similar requirement, uh, required training uh, for people in the, in the remote areas or in other locations. So that is uh, one more advancement in this uh, uh, training um, platform capability offering. Uh, we also established a simulation trainings. For example, uh, the wind turbines today, are much more advanced than wind turbines 10 years ago. So for people to get the necessary skill to uh, diagnose the problems and uh, have the hand-on experience fixing the problems, doing the maintenance, or we can bring people to these uh, big simulators so that people can practice all kinds of situations to, to get proficient uh, uh, for their job. Uh, this is one uh, we, uh, this is uh, on the left hand, uh, you, you can see there's uh, a lot of, uh, also of course there's Chinese character, but list uh, some of the customized training that we can tailor made for the projects, for the customers, uh, for uh, partners that require um, the, the uh, specialized uh, need, uh, skills training. Uh, Goodwind also devel uh, devote a lot of effort in working with uh, colleges, higher education, um, because we are a uh, forerunner uh, in the industry in China. So we organized our uh, expert uh, to compile uh, a set of uh, books 
uh, that specialize on offshore wind farm um, education. Uh, this set of books uh, involves the designing, uh, developing, uh, uh, the construction, the maintenance, and project management of wind, uh, wind, uh, wind farms, uh, offshore wind farms. Uh, we also have uh, similar um, uh, textbooks uh, for onshore um, training as well. So those uh, textbooks is um, compiled and is offered uh, in a number of uh, universities and colleges in China. We also uh, extend our collaboration. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, customers sometimes uh, they do not have this uh, similar strong uh, skill training uh, platforms uh, as, a, as their own. So they can come to us and uh, uh, cooperate with, with uh, our schedule and then send their people over. Uh, we also um, have uh, uh, joint uh, education programs uh, for communities that, that we serve. Right now we have six or seven uh, colleges uh, who is uh, in interested in establishing uh, uh, wind uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, curriculums so that we, we can uh, offer our expertise and uh, also to support their education development as part of Goldwyn social responsibility. Um, I think that is uh, basically a very brief um, uh, introduction about uh, what we do uh, as a company uh, when we think about the development of the industry, which is still is developing very fast, but it's still in the, in the early stage. So we as a company, we uh, put a lot of effort uh, equipping our own employees with the necessary uh, skills and the safety and environment knowledge. Uh, we also uh, would willing to uh, working with our customers and the communities in supporting uh, their development of uh, human capital who is uh, interested uh, in this industry and uh, supporting the industry for health uh, development for the long run. So that is a very brief introduction and uh, um, Again, thanks for the opportunity and looking forward uh, to uh, further discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think this is very impressive. I mean, also to see the growth that your company personally has seen. So you had the challenge and we see that you have taken an active role in helping to develop the human resources that uh, your company needs, but also your partners need. Um, so, yeah, that was, I think, very important uh, perspective. Now, I have a second uh, question here for you. Uh, so I launched that poll as well, which I think fits to uh, what Goldwyn has presented. Is there enough opportunities for wind renewable energy training in your country? Uh, as a general question, and is the wind renewable energy technicians training well covered in your country region? But I request you to um, answer these two questions. And uh, in the meantime, I would then continue um, to our next speaker, again from China, this time not vocational training, but uh, the academic training education. Um, and it's a pleasure to invite Professor Liu Yongqian, again, forgive me for my pronunciation, from North China Electric Power University, one of the most important universities in that area in, in China who will speak about the development of wind energy engineering education in China. And we also all know that China has made also great progress in not only uh, training the technicians, but also the engineers. Professor Liu. Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Stephen. And uh, it's uh, my great honor to have this opportunity to uh, introduce uh, something about uh, wind power education in China. Can you hear? Uh, can you see the screen or yes, my sharing just, screen? Just use a presentation mode. Then. Oh, okay, good. Perfect. Okay. Yes, excellent. So I am from uh, uh, North China Electric Power University, 
School of Renewable Energy. So this university is uh, main focus on the energy and the electric power. And uh, uh, we have uh, 36,000 students, most of them working on energy and electric power related majors. So it's very big in terms of the electric power engineer, uh, engineering. And uh, we have the first undergraduate major on wind energy power engineering from 2006 and first renewable energy school in China from 2007. We also have a state key laboratory on alternative uh, electric power system with renewable sources. It's uh, the only national, such a national key laboratory. So today I want to uh, share you about the wind power education development in China and, and uh, uh, first slide and uh, the uh, 2006 is a very uh, milestone year for the wind power development because uh, January 1st that year, renewable energy law of People's Republic of China uh, became to effect and, uh, and it's uh, the starting uh, booming point. Uh, starting moving forward for the Chinese uh, wind power industry. And uh, in that year, and uh, sending by the Chinese Wind Energy Association and uh, by uh, Professor He, I also participate uh, in, the, in, in Canada, if somebody <laughs> remember, that is wind energy, uh, world wind energy, uh, Institute, uh, chaired by uh, Mr. Preben Magad. And uh, uh, although it doesn't uh, work whether well or now, but uh, we should, uh, I think it's a, also a very good uh, example to show the international collaboration on the wind, wind power tr uh, training and education. So also at the same year, uh, we, our university, supported by the, uh, the uh, Chinese government and Chinese industry, especially Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, Wind Energy Association. We established the first uh, uh, undergraduate program on wind, we call wind energy and power engineering. In 2007, we established the renewable energy school in, at our university. And uh, 2009, we have the PhD program and and a master program on renewable and clean energy, uh, uh, including, of course, including wind. And 2011, Ministry of Education of China established a new uh, undergraduate uh, major called the New Energy Science and Engineering. And our uh, wind energy power engineering is included in that. So the, until now, all over China, there is uh, uh, there is uh, 58 uh, doctor degree program and master degree 12 uh, in China, Chinese universities to offer uh, relate, wind related uh, programs. So from 2006, we have uh, 30 students on undergraduate and then now in China, there are 100 18 universities uh, have, the, have the, the courses on, on re, uh, new energy science and engineering. Most of them are, uh, have the wind, has wind courses. So the, the, the students in China enrolled in renewable uh, in this year is more than 10,000. So next, uh, I want to show you something about the program development. Uh, first, uh, before we know that, first uh, we should uh, mention the characteristics of wind power technology. First, it's highly interdisciplinary. Uh, in, for wind, you, for example, it involving the aerodynamics, mechanical, electrical, automation materials. And also it's high-end new technology 
and uh, uh, with uh, with high risks. We know uh, that, and uh, also it's very the development technology is very rapid. So the update of knowledge, teaching material, even the position, working position, the working methods of the industry also changed very fast. And also this industry is uh, have a high dependency on the policy and the regulations. Until now, we need the incentive measures uh, to, to, to help the wind energy industry. So the objective to, uh, for our undergraduate program for wind, uh, we have mainly, uh, I have the following point. First, we should ed educate them as uh, have a high sense of uh, social responsibility and so solid theoretical foundation and ability of uh, this uh, multidisciplinary innovation and international vision. So, you know, as a higher education of engineering in this world, there is a the paradox and uh, between the general education and professional education, it's, which is uh, uh, the, 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 the focus is different. For example, in for the general education, they normally uh, don't care about the, the uh, too much about uh, the skills and the capacities and mainly care about uh, their, their fundamental and uh, their uh, liberal arts and thinking, the way of thinking. But uh, for the professional education, we are focused on more, more, uh, more, uh, more uh, for future uh, work uh, or oriented. So how to uh, build a, a courses for wind power so uh, there we invite a lot of uh, advices from our experts and, and especially uh, all, uh, so our uh, so Professor Her also among the experts who give our, a, lot, a lot of good advice. So we should uh, uh, the wind power wind uh, power education program curriculum development. We found we, we think we should merge the two. That means we should have the com combination of general education and also the professional education. So our courses are, are uh, incorporated in the three blocks. One is we call it foundation, uh, solid foundation for further study and research like math, physics, and, in and English. Second is about uh, some systemic understanding of fundamental knowledge of wind power, like aerodynamics, mechanical, electrical, and control. And uh, the third block is specialized courses, including the, uh, that which means professional knowledge and capacities or wind power engineering, like uh, wind resources, uh, wind farm, and wind turbine, electric system, and automation, etc. So that's the structure of our undergraduate program. Um, so, and uh, in addition to the undergraduate program, we also offer master PhD, uh, PhD program. So the, these three just uh, together, the, ju just the form of the, our higher education system on wind power in China. In terms of a bachelor degree, we just try to keep the balance between the general education and professional education. For the master degree, we try to uh, emphasize on innovation and entrepreneurship. For PhD, we try to, uh, um, to uh, cultivate the originality on wind power science and engineering. And uh, we also focus on the, 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 the capacity building. So in order to ensure the quality of the education, we should have the quality of the uh, capacity. So first, uh, uh, the textbooks uh, and teaching materials development. So we developed special uh, kit uh, set of uh, books 
on the wind, on the wind, uh, wind power engineering, like uh, uh, principle of the wind, wind power. And uh, when the uh, uh, wind power generating system design and uh, manufacturing and uh, electrical system for wind farms and uh, wind turbine monitor and control and a wind power plant. And also other, uh, other also aerodynamics and uh, books is still under development. Uh, second, we try to uh, have the uh, resources sharing. And uh, now we have the China Renewable Energy Education Union. We have uh, more than 100 uh, university as the members and also include some uh, some in, uh, companies. So the idea is to uh, construct and uh, share the teaching uh, materials and uh, resources to, and together. And uh, also we do the uh, teacher teaching research to try to improve our way of teaching. And uh, the fourth way we just try to the further in practical. Uh, engineering practical uh, education. So we internships. Actually, most many famous companies are our uh, pre uh, internship uh, uh, basis, uh, including Goldwyn and uh, in, uh, in, uh, some biggest uh, wind, wind, wind power uh, developers. So uh, in, uh, for the employment from the arena, we know that uh, uh, the, the global demand for wind power uh, in 2018 is 1.1 billion. And uh, among them, 44% of wind power jobs is from China. So the, we can see that uh, employment for employment for our uh, uh, that means uh, half half a million employees. So the demand uh, for China uh, for wind jobs is very high. And also, uh, actually, uh, our students also work for the for the other uh, the, for the foreign companies, uh, even work abroad. So I see. So the employment employment uh, rate is very high. So third part, I just uh, give uh, several points uh, to for the development trend of wind power education in China. First, uh, we can see that the wind power industry will grow sustainably in the long term. Just uh, several days ago, you know, our president Xi just addressed in the United Nations, and uh, he just uh, promised that uh, we will achieve carbon neutral uh, by 2060. So I think and we in the, uh, in the, the next uh, uh, 40 years, we, the Chinese wind industry will grow sustainably. So the demand for talents of wind power in China and the world will keep growing. So uh, we think the education and and uh, we uh, the university not only in china we we think is all, all over the world the wind power engineering education have very bright future and uh, and more and more chinese university and especially top universities you know they are strengthening their wind power education programs so so the china has the possibility to supply the first class wind power education for the world. Uh, so the, and also the international education collaborations are necessary to meet the wind power industry demand for talents. So we know, as we, uh, we, we have, we heard from the former speakers, I, I really feel very glad that we have very similar feeling. So international collaboration is very important. 
So in conclusion, and first, I think uh, the wind power education should follow the combination of general education and professional education in terms of uh, curriculum development. And uh, second, for the higher education system uh, in China, we uh, already have the, uh, the capacity to supply qualified talents with bachelor, master, and PhD. And third, I think the Chinese government, CWEA, Chinese Wind Energy Association, I mean, and uh, wind power industries and international organizations plays very important role on the wind power education development. So I, uh, in the past 15 years, I, I, I think without those help, I think uh, we cannot uh, create uh, such a kind of uh, new way, new, uh, new uh, curriculum. The last point, we just propose to establish a coordinated nation mechanism to strengthen the wind power education uh, collaboration. For example, our dream, I, I, think, I think it's a dream that the World Wind Energy Institute that uh, 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 we signed in, in Canada and uh, maybe it's a good solution. So I, I, if, if it's possible, I want to, uh, to contribute my, my work. So thank you. That's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Liu. And that is really an impressive also story that you're telling us about the development. Now you said you have 10,000 students in the, in the field of uh, wind power. That is indeed a great achievement. And also, I mean, just how to set up all these curricula and uh, organize that uh, all these students have the professors that can teach them are knowledgeable enough. And your dream, that's uh, one purpose, of course, is this webinar that we discuss and see how we are now around the world and uh, whether we can jointly form new initiatives and come to such uh, new forms or, or maybe indeed re yeah. um, rewived uh, um, yeah. collaboration. <laughs> Revitalize. <laughs> yes, let's, let's try that. And uh, after I think listening to our speakers here indeed, uh, I think uh, we already hear now what the different needs are. And from the poll that uh, we are making, and this is the first time we try this, I already see we have many experts amongst us and people have also um, different experience. I think that's important to, to share that kind of experience. Let me, let me share now our third set of questions here, which I think is related to what we just heard. Is there a coordination mechanism among existing training institutes in your country and region? And is there a need for standards at the different levels of wind renewable energy training? I can understand this, of course, on the national level, but also on the international level. Again, thank you, Professor Liu. And with this, we go to our next speaker, uh, which is, um, again, more in the field of uh, non-academic vocational training. It's my pleasure to invite Yu Hui, again, sorry for my bad pronunciation, from GWO China Committee. And you will speak about safety training in wind energy, a very important aspect. And I think Goldwind was already making reference to the work that you're doing. Now we look forward to hearing from you. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to share my screen first. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. The screen, Stephen. Is yes. that okay? Perfect. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And dear President, dear President He also, uh, thank you for the in invitation to this uh, webinar. It's an honor to have this opportunity to share with you the safety training in the wind energy industry. And there are three parts of the presentation. One is the status of GW safety training. One is demand in the future. And also another point we want to emphasize digitalization. So what is, uh, what is GW safety training? Actually, uh, the previous uh, speakers, uh, Mr. Ho already mentioned a little bit in his presentation in Goldwind. 
What is GWO? GWO, Global Wind Organization, is a nonprofit uh, organization organized by wind turbine manufacturers and owners, aiming at an injury a free work an injury-free work environment in the wind energy uh, industry by setting common international standards uh, for safety training. So there are BST, basic safety training, which includes first aid, fire awareness, working at heights, manual handling, sea survival, and BTT, mechanical, electrical, hydraulic installation, and uh, several newly reduced, uh, introduced uh, standards. Actually, uh, we can see some pictures from Mr. Ho's pre presentation about the GWO training already. The GWO is not only uh, an organization that sets up uh, standards, it also runs an ecosystem. Uh, GWO itself doesn't provide uh, training services, but there are training providers all over the world that use GWO standards. Once they are audited by the uh, qualified certification bodies, they can provide GWO training service, and then GWO will issue, they can issue the delegates and certificates with the GWO logo, and they will update information of the delegates to the wind ID of GWO, so that those records can be uh, searched and tracked worldwide which means if you take GW training from one location at any corner of the world, it will be recognized uh, internationally. So if you're trained in China, when you stepped out of China to work in Europe, in South Africa, uh, South America, Africa, it will be recognized also over there. So it will save time and efforts. It won't be double trained. That was the, uh, the goal, one of the goals of GWO. By the end of 2019, almost 90,000 people representing 194 nationalities hold valid GWO training certificate already. The GWO training workforce rose about 20% year on year, which means in 2020, there will be 111,000 workforce trained uh, according to GWO standards. But GWO has modules. So one person can have one or more than one modules trained. As I said before, uh, or there like first aid, fire awareness, different modules. So by the end of the year, no, in the year of 2019, actually, a GWO training providers delivered almost 200,000 modules. And in 2020, we are expecting to reach 247,000 modules trained in the whole world. Here is a map about the distribution of training providers that are providing GWO safety training. As you can see that Europe is already uh, pretty well covered because GWO originally is from Europe. And also you can see that in China, in North America, uh, in uh, South America and also Africa, the increment is pretty big. And to help and promote GWO better in this big market in China, we created the GWO China Committee by GWO and CWEA. Now we have about 40 members in the Chinese uh, GWO China Committee covering uh, uh, owners, uh, wind turbine manufacturers, training equipment manufacturers, third party training institutions, third party, uh, uh, third party certification bodies, and the insurance company, and so on. As you can see that I put uh, some logos of the companies over there. Goldwind is definitely one of them. Uh, it has all the modules covered already uh, alongside uh, with uh, Shanghai Electric. So they are providing training service in China. They are the biggest driving force here. Um, there is the statistics we have in 2019, the number of GW issued certificates in China reached 3,050. As you can see that in 2017, it's only 660. That was like, uh, because GW entered China in 2016, basically. So we see a very big increment in the past four or five years. Now there are total 12 training providers in China located in several provinces in China. As you can see, I emphasized uh, on the map. 
So, so let's talk about the demand in the future. Uh, I want to give you a, a case scenario. I wouldn't focus on the overall increment of wind energy, but offshore wind energy here. So here is some statistics from, uh, from GWAC basically. So we have this uh, uh, increment, increasing trend of the installation capacity uh, of offshore winds. So that is 29.1 gigawatts by the end of 2019. So uh, GWAC expects 50 gigawatts of new installations by 2024, five years later. And also European policymakers are looking to installations of 450 gigawatts in 2015. Well, the rest of the world will possibly deploy as much as 500 gigawatts offshore wind by 2050. What about China offshore? China has become one of the major markets for offshore wind, of course, in recent years, with the installed offshore capacity reaching 7 gigawatts by the end of 2019, with an annual growth rate of 55%. According to ARENA, there would be significant offshore wind development deployment in China. Insula installation capacity would reach about 56 gigawatts by 2030. 30 and 382 gigawatts by 2050. Why would I mention those numbers over here? That means there will be a very large demand of workforce in offshore wind. Let's not talk about uh, offshore wind in the future. What's the current situation here? Demand workforce at this moment and the training providers that could provide the proper training. So, Roughly estimated, China may have nearly 40,000 offshore wind workforce by now, 40,000. By the end of the year of 2020, China will have like four training centers who can provide sea survival training. Let's make assumption that each training provider can provide 100 courses of sea survival training. That is like two and twice per week. So one course would have 12 technicians attend, attending. That is according to the GWO uh, standards. So each year we will have like 4,800 technicians trained, only 12% of the need by now. So that will take like eight years to get all the technicians trained, which means we need to get more training providers that could provide proper training, especially in sea survival uh, training because it does brings a lot of risk to the technicians over there. And we've already seen a lot of accidents uh, uh, from those technicians. And in the past year, uh, in the September of 2019, we had this uh, uh, global uh, stra uh, strategy session in Denmark. So all of these uh, uh, big uh, OEMs and also developers participated uh, the meeting. So we set up a goal in the coming three years. For example, 2022, we would have like 200,000 workforce trained according to GW standards, 450 modules completed. Um, that is quite ambitious actually. So how are we going to achieve that? So that will be the second, third part of my presentation, digitalization. That is definitely one of the solutions we can achieve our ambitious goal. So let me uh, introduce uh, some, you know, the, the facts of the uh, training under the pandemic of the coronavirus. Uh, so that is 2018, 2019. So you can see from the beginning, like the second uh, quarter of the 2020, you see the decrement of the uh, trained workforce from GWO. That is due to the pandemic first in China and then Europe, um, US and all over the world. We definitely see the decrement because, uh, because of the uh, tra uh, traveling restrictions. People cannot go to the uh, training sites. People cannot gathering. So that is kind of the limits of the current training measures. And then GWO introduced this online partial refresher, BSTRP, in April 2020. That is very quick response by GWO. And I have like uh, uh, three uh, screenshots uh, that is uh, done by uh, Vichai Vestas. Uh, so people can do the refresher of the training course 
uh, online with their mobile phones over there. So that definitely helps uh, uh, those delegates to refresh their skills because after two years, the, the skills will fade, but it doesn't require them to take the, uh, the full course uh, to uh, renew their certificates, but only some refresher courses. So they develop these app, uh, applications. People can do that during their uh, very flexible time. So they don't have to take the course like the whole day, but it can take like two hours here and two hours there, very flex flexible and also low cost. And this uh, uh, experiment actually opens the door for digitalization uh, training. So GWO put the digitalization training on top of GWO's standards and also uh, organized a few webinars like this one uh, to see uh, the challenges, the benefits, and what we can do about this uh, new topic. And here are the three uh, uh, webinars we were talking about. Like, first of all, how are we going to guarantee the quality of learning? Are we going to rewrite the standards? Uh, how are the training providers uh, build their capability to provide high quality training with this new uh, idea? For example, are we going to use uh, uh, mobile, computer, VR, uh, AR, those kinds of new technologies, those kinds of stuff were discussed. And then the second webinar were about uh, how are the uh, certification bodies uh, guarantee the uh, quality, uh, the quality of the training, because now it's only about uh, the third party certification body. When they do, uh, they do the auditing, they will check how the training providers are providing those, uh, 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 those training surveys. But when it becomes a digital, digitalized training, so it will have new problems to solve. For example, a remote audit, on-site audit. So they are all open questions to be discussed. And then the third one is about, uh, is digitalization gonna help the growth of GW training? So there are like uh, uh, four or five uh, expertise in the webinar and also uh, a lot of uh, uh, audience over there to see what we can do. Uh, that is, uh, that is, as I think, the, the final question we have to answer is that digitalization going to be the best solution or one of the best solutions to help the uh, uh, growth and adoption of GW standards. And finally, I want to go back to this, uh, this map uh, because you've already seen a lot of dots over there in Europe. We definitely want to see more dots on other parts of the of the of the map, uh, especially in China, in North America, and then some rising markets, uh, India, Africa. So we also would like to uh, to welcome people who are interested in this area, so we can get some collaboration uh, to really promote this very valuable uh, training method and the training concept. That's the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was uh, also an excellent presentation. And uh, I'm sure that um, what you said, where you have the gaps, there is also a need and we work of course with people from there. Um, certainly uh, be very useful indeed to bring those people together and, and help them to get the training that you're already doing, which is such an important part. Now, Thank you. Um, at this point of time, to our Chinese speakers, I think uh, we have now an excellent idea of the situation of, in particular, wind power training in China. And now we move towards Africa. And uh, I have the special pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Ibrahim Togola, um, who is a vice president of World Wind Energy Association, but he's also uh, chairman of the Mali Folke Center. And uh, Ibrahim, you're you have many other positions. You are the, the founding chair of the African Platform for Community Power and Electrification. And you're also chair of uh, Access, which is a company that deals with rural electrification in West African countries. So you know from various angles what the needs are for training education. Um, Ibrahim. Yes. Now, okay. The floor is uh, yours. And a great okay. welcome to Bamako. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It was very important so, to have uh, this great opportunity 
to participate to this uh, very important uh, webinar uh, and see also that uh, how China is already doing great, uh, you know, in not only on wind but also on other renewable energy. Um, so it's my uh, uh, great honor. So I will uh, bring you here in Africa, in Bamako, West Africa. Uh, we, you know, we are working on the ground, but we also with uh, combined activities and experience, we launch uh, the African Institute for Renewable Energy, Climate and Innovations, and where we are working with the Danish Forty Center on this concept, and uh, which is based on uh, the twenty year experience of the Mali Forty Center uh, on the ground here. And, uh, uh, so we are receiving many students uh, from um, various university, from Mali, from different African countries, and even also from uh, outside Africa. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so what is the mission of uh, our institute we are working on now? Uh, it's been quite, uh, we wanted to mobilize some resources uh, to do our institute work, I have to say, have been very challenging uh, to do that. And uh, we had some, uh, after many work with uh, Danish forest centers, so we decided that we have to start this from scratch with uh, our own resources. And um, to, in order to promote, uh, you know, uh, Africa in the area of innovations and research development, uh, you know, by pro uh, providing local expertise that at the level of renewable climate and technological innovations. So it's also the way to enhance uh, economic securities and improve quality of life in Africa. That's some of the mission we put on that in that center, which is very well located, just uh, 120 kilometers south of Amago. Uh, you know, we, we have a kind of a nice place for, for this world. Next slide. Africa is a very huge, the uh, population of Africa is very young. And uh, I think uh, more than 60% of Africans are today under 25 years old. And um, is uh, also a kind of frontier of the next uh, economic growth of the world, you know, because uh, the economies in all the 54 countries of Africa are really growing. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, we have uh, today, when it comes to access to energy, I think uh, about the billion people we are saying, so 60% of them are located in Africa. So we, we have also the job sector is still very much informal and primary sectors. So all of us know that Africa is uh, more producing raw material, which are exported to so-called industrialized countries. And uh, this is mainly due to lack of uh, energy and appropriate education. So access to energy, modern energy services, and also capacities is, uh, is essential to really transform this. And uh, so the graduates, uh, you know, so uh, sector are more less technical. We have more humanitarian, uh, we invest uh, training more humanitarian sectors, uh, lawyers and accounting and so on, and uh, less uh, vocational uh, training sectors. So we have a very, uh, we can say that because at Manifold Center and Axis, uh, especially access when we are doing the work on the installation of uh, mini grids. And uh, so we face a lot of very limited qualified uh, uh, technicians uh, to do, to face the challenges we are, uh, you know, we are facing. The next slide. So, yeah, so we, we, so the, so the point here is to set up uh, that uh, we work into set up the local expertise because we don't have to get experts all the time from from outside the, the Mali. And uh, you know, like the Chinese have been mentioning that the key is to have the right educations, uh, which is uh, feeding the need 
the local needs, you know, and um, so that we, you know, our 20 year experience on renewable here at the facilities. So to develop the qualified training adapted to the need and sell the as a technical and commercial platform for renewable energies and climate change and contribute to making renewable energy affordable because sometimes we, we, we just have to import the equipment and, and to deploy it, but uh, there are a lot of uh, capacity how to, to adapt and adjust uh, those technologies which come from outside to really our, our needs. So that's something um, uh, uh, the key elements. So we we think here that it's, it's essential to design the thinking, design process, uh, small project, technical aspects, uh, teamwork. So so that that is a space we we we, we are creating here, and uh, not only for Mali but for Sahelian and all the Sahelian countries in West Africa. Next slide. So you can see we have. Uh, we get uh, great support from Mali, Malian authority. We have uh, one of the best locations. We are just uh, at the feet of the hydropower plant, uh, which is 44, mega, uh, 44 megawatt hydropower plant, and uh, with the big agricultural zones. And uh, surrounding our center is almost uh, 15,000 hectares, uh, which are irrigated and agricultural zones. And uh, we are just about to two hours driving uh, in the south outside Bamako. So, so it's a best location even to experiment small wind windmill because we have the dam, we have the lake. Uh, the lake is uh, 60 meters, uh, 60 kilometers long and uh, uh, about uh, five kilometers wide. So, so it's the area which is windy all year round. And, uh, because we have this uh, big surface of water, and uh, we have, you, know, you can it can be the best. And then also you have the 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 the, the, the rice field uh, which has about twelve thousand hectares, and um, so that's that's a kind of best location we could we could have for a kind of uh, renewable energy training training school. Uh, next, yeah. So this is a bit uh, the map we have about. Uh, uh, 3.5 hectares uh, land uh, with the facilities in uh, in that area. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's, uh, these are the buildings we have already, and uh, the offices, uh, training classes, classrooms, and uh, yeah. And then next slide, and also the yeah. So and then also the place for accommodations. So. We have about 20, 20 beds where you know for those who are coming from outside where they can they can be accommodated and, and to have access to, to training. Next one. Yeah. So we, we have, yeah, maybe back, a back. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it's a place where you know we we see this as a place where entrepreneurs can be work together, solve problems, create solutions. So because our uh, training program is not only just to train uh, uh, students, but it's also to have uh, entrepreneurs as well and uh, uh, technicians who really have, uh, uh, you know, can solve, uh, solve the issues. Yeah, next slide. So we, so is a uh, 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 four courses, master level universities, vocational training, and, uh, continuing education, incubation, innovations. So aspect the next one. And uh, so we are now uh, working on how to uh, select uh, high level trainers and uh, uh, and motivated learner and learners. Uh, Evaluate the training needs, work integration courses, uh, entrepreneurships, and uh, organization skill building. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So this this place is uh, uh, you know the, the, it's needed is a manifold center. Uh, next, uh, 
it's a Nordic Forest Center, Denmark, uh, Access Electrification, it's a company, and uh, was a partner institutions uh, we are exploring from Africa. Uh, we are already have a very good network in West Africa here, and uh, that we are open also for America, for Asia, for Europe, and resource person. So because, and just now also, in addition that we get the facility with the uh, uh, government, we also get some support from GZ. it's important to say, uh, to really launch our courses, because COVID, uh, the pandemic affects some of our work because uh, Mali had a very rigid uh, legislation. We were supposed to start this year uh, already in April, but it was very rigid that you cannot gather more than uh, 50 persons first and then more than 20 persons. So this has been uh, making it quite difficult for us to, to, to really uh, launch our activities this year. But now some of those uh, restrictions uh, have been removed. So you can go up to 50 people now together. So therefore we are now in uh, the, the airport of Mali was open, but we had also, uh, so we can move now on. So hand on work. So that is some of our complete activities that our partners are doing here is some of the activities that Access is doing. So I think you can see some of our solar panels, Jinko uh, uh, Solar, this is our warehouse and our truck, uh, where we are planting the Jinko Solar and Jinko is our two panels. We are electrifying uh, 21, we are making 21 solar electrifications this year uh, in different parts of Mali, and uh, which mobilize about 85 uh, technicians and engineers and uh, trainings and uh, with, uh, you know, solar panel and battery. And uh, uh, so this, this is what we see as a training. So when we have, uh, you know, all the dimensioning work, all the planning works, and um, the, the center is a place also where we are going to work a lot on agriculture and renewable energies and um, different also uh, the uh, previous speaker I mean, work on uh, digitalizations that we are working quite uh, a lot on uh, uh, digital, uh, smart metering and uh, you know the, 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 the digitalization of farms you know all the irrigation systems with the greenhouses and so on so and also all the agricultural tools manufacturing in uh, you know, that's, uh, so you need a kind of good knowledge of metal and metal work using uh, energy to for, for, for transformation. So, but all the base of this is to provide electricity in the rural areas, and uh, because uh, Mali is seventy percent of the population uh, are, are in the rural areas or countryside. So, it's, it, 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 like Mali, this is also the same for the other you know, African countries. So we see solar, wind, biomass, uh, you know, and geothermals, because the northern part of Mali, we have a lot of potential of geothermals, and also in the central part, so it was a country also always in, uh, in Africa. So so Africa have a, uh, a huge, huge potentials, you know, of, of renewables, and uh, which have been uh, uh, so underutilized due to lack of capacities, and uh, of this uh, huge young potential people we have. So we see as a place to, to, to really develop that and uh, in order to harvest, you know, this huge potential in order that, uh, and we believe Africa can live from, you know, to, 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 to be in a place in the next five, 10 years uh, among the leaders of, of renewable energies countries in the world. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, thank you very much. And this is a few slides I wanted to show. <laughs> Excellent, Ibrahim. I think you're doing really great work. Everybody can see this. Um, and uh, it's also, of course, very important that you mentioned, like our previous speaker, about the impact that the current uh, COVID-19 uh, situation has on you. Um, but of course, it's, it's fantastic to see uh, that, on the one hand, that the work that you've been doing um, uh, what you're planning to do and uh, certainly also good to know that there is uh, collaboration, international collaboration already in place 
we can uh, then find out and check how we can improve this kind of collaboration. Um, now, I have another question for all of you, uh, which I will now put on the screen. I invite everyone to uh, take part in it. Two small short questions, um, which I think is a question that um, is, of course, uh, we've seen now Mali, I think Ibrahim as a lot is, is depending on your initiative as a non-governmental uh, organization. But um, what is your opinion? Is wind renewable energy education well taken into account in the policy making? Do we need more support from governments? And uh, should there be an information tool on education policies for policy makers? So everybody's uh, invited to um, answer those questions. And at the end, we will give you the uh, outcome of all the questions. Again, great thanks to Bamako, to Bye. Ibrahim. And uh, now we go to our next speaker. Uh, and that is uh, um, Jose Echeverry. We go now to Canada. Jose, great pleasure to have you on board. Um, and a very good morning. I know it's early morning, but we uh, kept you as one of the last speakers so that you don't need to um, speak when you are maybe not yet waking up totally. <laughs> Ibrahim, um, sorry, uh, Jose, great pleasure having you. You are a professor at York University, uh, which is a university in Toronto, in Ontario. And uh, you have also created uh, the International Renewable Energy Academy. So we're talking more about, again, I assume academic training. We look forward to hearing from you and your academies and universities activities in training and education. Um, thank you, Stefan. Good morning, everybody. Good day or good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Very good, very good. Thank you very much. Um, so it is a pleasure to be uh, here and to see so many of my good friends, some of you that I haven't seen in so many years. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, I send blessings to all of you. Uh, and the key uh, thing that I want to say to you uh, is in these difficult times, uh, make sure to stay strong, positive, uh, and let's keep uh, advancing renewable energy to benefit the human race. Uh, the climate crisis is much bigger than the pandemic crisis. Uh, so let's stay focused on solving the climate crisis. Uh, but right now, let's stay healthy to be able to uh, do that as well. So um, my name is Jose Echeverry. I work at York University, uh, which is one of uh, the biggest universities in Canada. It's a public university. And I wanted to share with you um, that what's very important about the university right now is that we just ad adopted a new uh, academic plan for the years 2020 to 2025. Uh, this plan uh, means that everything we do in the university, now it's focused on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I think we're one of the first universities in Canada, if not in the world, to have a five-year plan focused on satisfying uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals at the local level. Uh, I'll give you an example on how we're doing that. Uh, we have adopted in the Board of Governors a policy for local procurement. Uh, as many of you may know, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number one, it's to end poverty. Uh, so that measure was taken uh, to ensure that they can be local employment, local economic activity. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is from the perspective of sustainability, uh, we're developing a climate solutions park uh, whose uh, main purpose is to ensure that we can address uh, sustainable development goal number 13 and create a place for experiential learning, uh, research and knowledge mobilization focused on the solutions to climate change. And to do that, we're focusing on using uh, an approach called STEAM. Uh, STEAM is like STEM, but instead of uh, focusing just in uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, we add an A, uh, which is for arts. Uh, to achieve that, we've partnered with a group called Arts Health, 
Uh, and I wanna show you a little movie uh, that uh, our friends from Arts Help have uh, helped us to make. Um, so bear with me for 30 seconds uh, and I'll show you this movie. Here we go. You don't have to have a PhD or be a scientist. Climate solutions exist. Housing, affordable. Food, grow it. Energy, make it clean. Education, learn by doing it yourself. Technology, build it. Ride, charge it. Art, love it. Where? Climate Solutions Park. Where you come, learn, enjoy, take it home, pass it on. Okay, I hope um, you like that uh, sneak preview, uh, synopsis of what we're doing. Um, and now uh, I want to end by providing you an example of how we have to pivot uh, to uh, ensure that we can continue to uh, provide educational experiences during these pandemic times. Um, so all of us that are educators have to pivot uh, and I want to show you how we are pivoting. Um, and this is a very micro level example of something that a lot of you are doing uh, right now. And I wanted to uh, end my presentation with this example so you can actually see uh, how we're doing things and hopefully get some ideas for your own uh, work in uh, these uh, things. So if you give me 30 seconds again, uh, I will show you this uh, short movie and I'll end with that. Uh, this movie is last week's class in my class on uh, renewable energy, which is a class that it's offered for undergraduate students, uh, masters and PhD students, and also for professional development. Uh, we have a First Nations liaison officer that help us connect with First Nations so we can actually uh, honor the traditions of First Nations. Um, and we have to do things now digital, uh, but we also do it physically using uh, COVID safety protocols. Um, so the lesson that you're gonna see right now uh, was uh, broadcast uh, in an asynchronous manner. Um, and it basically uh, tells the story of how at York University, we can uh, get rid of our uh, polluting energy sources uh, which are based mostly on fossil fuels at the moment uh, by using, uh, in this specific case, solar energy. Um, so it's a short video that was shown before uh, we started the class so the students could see this. So you bear with me, I'm gonna show you that so you can see how we're doing these things. So that's the name of the class. It's. Uh, um, broadcast in a number of ways. Uh, we use the United, Sustainable Develop United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And here you can see, we're saying it's possible to replace our university combined heat and power plan. And then we say, how, how can we do that? Um, and we can do that uh, in this specific case, we give the students the idea of why don't you find an old parking lot um, so they can, um, focus on developing solutions in this parking lot. So that's an actual parking lot in the university. Uh, then we do calculations, we measure uh, what this, and then we say, well, why don't we transform it into a solar housing? So it actually can be uh, something a little bit better uh, than it is. And here you can see we show some solar buildings that already exist. Uh, and that's where the uh, asynchronous part of the class, which is offered online, uh, ends. So you can see we use a number of uh, social media channels to express what we're trying to do. Uh, and then uh, we ended the class by um, we ended the class by me uh, going to one of these solar buildings. Uh, and broadcasting live uh, from that solar building. Uh, and by being in these solar buildings, which are located close to uh, the university campus, the students using Zoom 
have the time to ask me and the experts that I work with how such solar buildings are built. Uh, and we end the class by linking to resources that the students can download, for example, Red Screen Expert, uh, which is a software that allows them to calculate the financial uh, costs of building such affordable solar buildings, uh, and then calculate the CO2 emission reductions that are possible, which in Canada are now uh, you can monetize the CO2 emission reductions to help finance projects. So I wanted to give you this uh, real-time example of how we're teaching uh, at York University today. Uh, and uh, I'm opening for some questions that you may have. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for uh, the time that you've invested to be in here. And I wanna end, uh, Stefan, if I may, by uh, seconding uh, the idea from my uh, Chinese colleagues of re restarting uh, the World Wind Energy Institute. Uh, we started that in 2006, and it was a pleasure to see uh, that our colleagues in China have quantum leaps so far into uh, the work that they're doing. Uh, myself here at York University will be very happy to work with my colleagues in Africa, Asia, Latin America and other parts of the world, uh, Australia, to make sure that we create now this uh, global institute for renewable energy. And us here at York University would be very happy to be your North American partner. Uh, and I'm happy to open conversations on how we can make that dream into a pragmatic reality. The time has come now to regroup and to ensure that we can have uh, a new strategy on a post-pandemic world uh, where we train the leaders of the present uh, to ensure that we can take over the energy systems of the world with renewable energy in general and specifically with wind power. Thank you very much, Stefan, and to my colleagues for your time. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jose. And I think it's, I'm sure uh, what you do with your students must be very inspiring and you do great work really to, that's more important, I think, than anything else, educate, train, uh, the, educate the people so that they know uh, what renewable energy can deliver. Um, now, as you had this, this concrete uh, remark, and uh, I'm, I, I would just like to ask uh, Osman Benji to make some comments here on that offer also to collaborate, because Osman, I know you've been thinking a lot uh, about uh, um, how we can indeed have such a, a network or more than a network, something that really can work internationally. Um, Osman, are you with us? And would you like to yes, say a yes, few words? Yes, I do, I do, thank you. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. It's very, very much uh, interesting. And I was quite happy to see uh, all my friends from Canada, from Africa, etc. So uh, it is exactly what I, uh, what I thought and uh, what I believe in. There are um, too many spread uh, initiatives, wonderful initiatives. What we have heard today is just fantastic and encouraging. And uh, our objective, which is exactly what uh, Jose was saying, is to see how to create a synergy among all these ongoing initiatives and how to share this, uh, this uh, experience that's taken here and there. And I fully agree. If we would like to have or to tackle global issues, we have to get global initiatives. This is the aim of what we are trying to set. And uh, we will certainly get back to you later on, maybe on a bilateral way or see how we can uh, modality to do so and see how to can move ahead. But technical issues is good, but what I do believe that we cannot afford not involving also the policymakers because we need to back to be backstopped by also, uh, also political decisions. So thank you very much for sharing with us this wonderful and very exciting experiences. I do believe that after this uh, webinar, I will have certainly to debrief with, uh, with Stefan and see how we can make it right away 
after that to, to, to follow it up and uh, certainly get back to you and, and move ahead. If things goes well, we will certainly in the coming year make it, let's say, uh, 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 wild, uh, worldwide known initiative, but with your help, certainly. Thanks a lot. I, I, I think that we have, uh, we have raised uh, globally and it was really fantastic to see we are, of, uh, all of you. Thank you. We, are, we continue now because we're not dead at the end. Thank you for your comments. Um, now we, we have uh, someone, I think, uh, Osman, you also uh, know well. This is uh, Professor Galal Osman from Egypt, who will now uh, speak about uh, the experience that uh, not only he has in, in Egypt, but he will give us an update about the MENA region. Um, so, um, and, and at the end, last but certainly not the last speaker will be from the, the Folke Center in Denmark which has been uh, mentioned many times by several of the speakers. But now, Gala Osman, a welcome to, I assume you're in Cairo. And now we look forward to hearing from you and what is happening in Egypt and the MENA region. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, good morning, my friends in Canada. Good evening, Peter, in Australia. And good day for Europe and parts of the world. I'll talk on renewable energy education and in Egypt and shed some light on the MENA region. Shortly, MENA region is 60% of the population of the world. It has 19 countries. And this area has 60% of the world oil and 45% of the world natural gas. This is an idea about MENA renewable energy target by ARENA and the demand of the countries and the estimated demand will be 80 giga by 2030. As you see here in uh, Algeria, 22 gigawatt, Morocco, 11 gigawatt. There are champions, Saudi Arabia, 10 gigawatt. So the, uh, the demand for new jobs and the demand for water and food is another dimension not mentioned on the seminar, shortage of water and water desalination and water for agriculture and, uh, and, and food. So this is another part. Uh, MENA, uh, to, to live with the, time, with the time frame I have been giving to me, I like to, so that different places in, in, the, in the continent are having renewable energy institute, Morocco, in Rabat, and in different places, Tunisia, five centers in Egypt, I am going to touch in detail. And uh, this is in, uh, in North Africa. And then in Saudi Arabia, King Fahd of Petroleum, and in Jordan, and Oman, and the Emirates. So between the Arabian Gulf and the Atlantic Ocean, there are demand for renewable energy. What application? Let us have it uh, a deep thinking on this technology. Wind technology, not when the electricity is only needed, but we need wind pumping to get water uh, from so many uh, so 100 meters deep to, to have the desert. We have desert with 50 degrees centigrade, and we need water for pumping and for agriculture to produce food. Some of the waters around the coasts is saline. Then we need wind desalination. And then, of course, for the intermittency of renewable, we need energy storage and the smart grids. To go with sustainable development goals, we have to decarbonize our community from electricity and to decarbonize our transportation system. Then we go for electromobility and having charging station for e-vehicles run by wind and solar in different thousand of kilometers around the desert in Africa. This is the right side of the story. What about the left one? The country, the, the session, North Africa is blessed with solar radiation, 18 hours of radiation and very strong insulation. So solar technology to complement with wind, we talk for PV and concentrated CP, CSP. And this year I was having my BC project uh, 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 study. We're having now combination of PV and CSP. 
because we see CPU can have energy storage in molten sodium. So you run your PV system for the morning and then your CCB system will give you uh, energy. So it is dispatchable power for 24 hours. Isolated loads in decentralized places, you need pumping. You have water 100 meter deep and then you have sun and you have, you have no network for electricity and you have no water. Then solar pumping is coming and with 50 degrees centigrade, all the electrical loads on the Gulf in Oman and the Kuwait and so on, solar air conditioning. And of course in winter, DSH, domestic solar water heating to uh, power millions of electrical water heaters. And then come back again for the technology uh, of storage, smart grid, electromobility, and again, as complementary to, to solar uh, wind desalination, there is also solar desalination. Uh, already some programs has run. The first program was with Denmark since 2007 and the Arab Organization of Industrialization. And I'm going to talk much about that. It was 2007, 13 years ago, when Egyptian engineers went to Denmark to have electromechan wind mechanical and wind electrical. And I leave that to Tony and Yana to talk on that side. And then Egypt was lucky to host on 2011, the 10th World, the World Wind Energy Conference. And we are applying to host again, 22nd or 23rd with Elgona and Berlin University. Now we are working on in, in the north of Africa to have international renewable energy uh, university in Hurghada and the Red Sea. And uh, last November 19, we were lucky to get the fourth branch of the Folk Center to have Egypt MENA Folk Center after Mali and Uganda and Chile. And uh, no need to mention that uh, we are, uh, uh, since 1986, we got our, the Egyptian Wind Energy Association and as part founder of WOEA. The programs are, uh, uh, we start with Kassel University and Cairo University. This was for the last 10 years to get Master of Science in, uh, in, in wind and solar uh, and economic analysis and ecological and regulatory. This is one of the first international cooperation program between Kassel University and Cairo University. Next. And then MIT, Massachusetts Technology in, in, uh, in, in Cambridge in USA, having a, a program now to have center of excellence of renewable energy with my university, Mansoura University, and the ancient university in Cairo and the Aswan University in the south, concentrating of concentrating solar power and solar fuels and we are doing well in this dimension. This is the second uh, international cooperation with USA. And then next. This is the course, the course three for the renewable energy program for five years, the program and the different disciplines and when the problem of uh, grid integration and the different technology and the combination of them. This is in uh, uh, the program has started with MIT, with mission in different places and the three universities. Next. Then the TU Berlin have a campus in Elgona where we would like to host you and invite you when we get the green light from the association to have the World Wind Energy Conference in 22nd or 23 or the time they are going to choose. In this university, they have energy, uh, water, water uh, master degree. So they don't go only for one dimension of energy, but energy of water and of urban development. So they have three master of science in this dimension with you Berlin as campus in Berlin and the students are going back and forth and they are uh, different demand scenarios and the market strategy scientific method regarding to economic decision. This is a third example in one of the institutes in Egypt 
And when I was in the survey for the MENO region, I spotted about 20 institutes scattered between Morocco and uh, till uh, Saudi Arabia and Oman and UAE and uh, uh, Qatar and Israel. So all the Arab region is blessed with sun and wind uh, and also oil. But now we have to decarbonize transportation and to decarbonize energy scenario. Next. A private institution after Corona pandemic go for e-learning. So this Green Energy Academy Egypt with SRH University in Germany, they go for system design, PV training, PV pumping, installation and decommissioning, and wind energy basics, and electromobility. It's also one of the item being addressed now in, uh, in, uh, uh, by e-learning. Next. This is the international this is cooperation between countries and, uh, and the Egyptian universities. Also, there is a international platform like Solar Energy International uh, around the world. And now they are going to have Middle East and Africa program, including system integrators, PV installers, technical sales people, system designer, PV system developers, and, and much more. So even the links are there. Uh, European Union and uh, is giving uh, 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 support to mutual program in wind energy between uh, Europe and uh, Egypt and Tunisia to uh, for to have training laboratories and implement in Egypt and Tunisia for uh, most master program skilled in wind energy sector. Uh, they are blessed with strong wind, like the west coast of Morocco and uh, in Tunisia and in Zafarana Red Sea, so different places. And then we 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 cannot neglect hybridization, wind and solar, and we and we should work on storage because there is no solar in the evening, and our demand the priority in the region is water, water for food as sustainable development goals and water for uh, agriculture and water for drinking, to have secure water, especially there's only one mile between the Arab Gulf till Morocco. Next. The courses by WESET, the German program, wind engineering, mechanical system, mechatronics and wind conversion and wind, en and wind energy system. And I'd like to add a small comment I was on the team with the World Wind Energy Institute, and I'd like to uh, uh, to get it back again, uh, live with with the call of my colleagues, and I call for uh, integration between the centers. We have been looking, hearing about islands of places in China, and we don't have a connection with them, and in in uh, in Toronto and in in Bamako. There is no connection or changing of them. And I recall at the last minute, there was a call by uh, Wu Gang from Goldwind, and I have submitted to Peter, let us work on wind, uh, World Wind Energy Education Conference for more or four times, because two or three times are very short for that. And I thank you for that. Last one. Egypt also is with the Mediterranean. So in Brussels and in Marsilia and the, uh, Spain, they are working also on CSB concentrated power knowledge and the innovation program. They are helping to accelerate CSB concentrated solar power, especially as in Spain, you have 18 hours of storage, 18 hours of storage. Then your system is dispatchable, can work 24 hours you avoid intermittency. I think this is the last slide. Any, anything more, John? Topics concerning CSCB, developing and managing national CSCB program. CSCB is in Chile and in China and in, in, in Spain and in, in Paris to California, but is not, and, and in South Africa, so, and in Morocco and in, in Dubai. So this new technology coming hand in hand with PV, 
and they are not competing together, but they are complementing each other, uh, and they are cost effective compared to other technology. And uh, in other application, like heat generation for industry, this industrial or non-electrical power generation, not everything with electrons. So I'm talking with water and also with heat when I'm talking about CSCP. I think this is the last one. This is a, a, a Middle East University in Amman with, in, with Egypt, and they have German University, and they have very special with the EU platform, ATC Grass, uh, wind, wind, also solar and wind energy uh, master of science. The program, next please. Wind energy technology, fundamentals, basics of environmental, electrotechniques, technical details of renewable energy, physical basis of wind, wind energy techniques, different sizes and functions of wind turbine, small and wind and big and, and offshore, planning conception and installation of wind power plant and wind energy parks, maintenance, preparation, uh, security system for wind energy power plants, economical assessment for wind energy projects, marketing, geological excursion on big wind energy project site, and the commercial communication on wind energy project investment, and then digitization, digitization, how to get the new uh, uh, communication technology on, on, on our system. And this is the last one, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Galal. That was also wonderful to hear from you first. What are the, the prospects also for wind power renewable energy in the MENA region? It's impressive to see what the targets are, and I'm sure it will be even more than that. And also to hear about what's already going on and that there's already a lot of international collaboration. And I'm also pleased to hear about your um, also uh, signal being positive about kind of restarting this international collaboration that we have. And now let's go to our, for this session, last speaker. I have to say that the person we have in our webinar, last speaker, Professor Sishan Adam Nayar from University of Karachi, he already, or his wife informed me that uh, he's suffering from COVID-19. So he's in hospital now and cannot join us. So we all should send our wishes to him, um, which means that we have uh, now one, um, well, actually group of speakers left. Uh, but that's a very special pleasure to welcome our friends from the Folke Center. And I think everybody uh, sh should know the Folke Center because the Folke Center, uh, which has many decades of experience, um, of course, is less involved in formal education and training, but you heard from many speakers already that uh, the work that you've been doing uh, has a special and, and a very long-term sustainable impact on renewable energy development around the world. Many people have visited the Folke Center, spent weeks and months there, learned a lot there. And now we hear um, from you looking forward to, um, I see Daniele and uh, Daniele Pagani and Tony Brink are there. The floor is yours. And in the meantime, I should just say, I, I will put up the last set of two questions. Uh, whether there is a need for regional centers that coordinate and uh, whether we should also address the general public about renewable energy education. Daniele and uh, Tony, are you with us? Or you are with us, but you like to start? I cannot hear you. Daniele looks you're not muted. Hello, 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 hello. Now I can hear something, yes. Can you hear us? Yes. <laughs> Good. So <laughs> thank you for the <laughs> invitation. And uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to apologize from uh, Jana she couldn't make it today, but we will try to do our best to cover also her part. 
And it's nice to be in such an international community with uh, having similar ideas because we have been mentioned several times, but I also don't know how many of you know about Folke Center. So I will just share my screen. Uh, second. You should be able to see my screen now. Yes, you just go to, if you can, I don't know what program it is, but presentation uh, mode. Yes. I don't think I can, yeah, full screen, yeah. So, uh, well, this is Folke Center for those of you that don't know it. And uh, yeah, it's on the screen here. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it has been establishing, established in 1983 by Private Megald, who by the way turned 85 just on Friday. So uh, he he's our pioneer and uh, expert in renewables and many of you know him already. But what he did, in uh, establishing this center is that he created a place where we can match uh, academia and uh, industry. So we are a connection in between these two worlds. And we get uh, a large variety of people um, yeah, from any kind of education, from any kind of background and from all over the world, which is also why we are so well known internationally. Our network in these 40 years has been incredible and I will make you, I will show you later a slide uh, to give you an idea of how big this network is. But it's not only professors and students that, uh, that we interact with, we, we have a lot of interaction also with the local community and with uh, people who might have an interest in renewables but they don't know much about it. So you can see in, uh, in the last line of our slide, uh, we used to have about 6,000 visitors every year just here in the center, just to learn about different renewable energy technologies. Then of course, this year with uh, Corona, our numbers have been a little bit down, but still this shows how much it's Folke Center present, both at local and international community. And uh, our goal is uh, to promote sustainability and promote uh, society power by 100% renewables. And we get there in different uh, approaches. So one of the approaches that have been, uh, well, let's say focus center is always focused on education. And then there are different ways of educating people. And one of them is to provide uh, events, conferences, webinars like this. And another is just to try to make them learn uh, by doing and give them the tools to uh, give them the tools to to, yeah, to, to get further in their uh, education, let's say. So for this reason, uh, we have been uh, developing uh, biogas solutions, uh, manuals actually, in which people could actually take them and start their own biogas plant. And this of course goes for the private user, but as well for small companies, which, which might not have the needed uh, knowledge, might not have the needed resources to go in this field. But once these manuals are available, then it is possible for companies to, to get in this, uh, in this aspect. And Tony will talk more about that uh, in the later slide. And then we have also focused a lot on biofuels, hydrogen, and then what we would call now with modern terms, power to X, or meaning excess power management. And why so? Because we live in a, if we go back to the to the slide, you can see that we are in the northwest part of Denmark. And this area, if you look in the map, a little larger view, you will see that it's, uh, it basically has no barriers from Greenland to, to us, meaning that wind can become very strong. And therefore, the excess power problem that it's now faced in some countries has been here since, since many years already. So we have to think on solutions on how to use this, uh, this solution, this uh, extra power. And one of the ways we do it, for example, is that we, we turn it into hot water, which might not seem very logic, but when you look at the, at the amounts of hot water needed on a yearly base in Denmark, then it makes sense also economically. So it's also a way of start thinking a little outside the box and, see, and seeing things outside the, the books and see a little bit more, how do we integrate different renewable uh, solutions into, into our lives? And by far the most important uh, 
training part of this has been related to wind. And yeah, only yeah, and uh, and and therefore we have we have been very popular in traveling the world and technology transferring Danish uh, wind turbine technology by using our old uh, design manuals, mostly on wind, but also on. Uh, on other types of renewable, like Daniel mentioned, uh, biogas and, uh, but especially on, on, on wind, these uh, design manuals was taken from the, from using the design standards and making them into a practical manual for small entrepreneurs to directly use. This way they could see their way into to the wind industry. And by having these manuals, Denmark managed to get 25 manufacturers on board making wind turbines in the early eighties. And, and some of these fa uh, factories are actually Vestas and, and Siemens today. So it, it has been quite successful. And uh, and therefore, this program has all been very popular and very easy to, to travel the world with, uh, with, with these manuals. Uh, and, and the manuals have taken us into a, into a lot of, of work together with, with small and medium scale enterprises. Uh, because as soon as they, they caught interest from the manuals, uh, today you'll probably use YouTube to get entrepreneurs, uh, at, to attract young entrepreneurs, but, but you need a little more than, than just a YouTube to, to be professional. And that's where the book came in together with the contact with the small entrepreneurs. Uh, and this way, uh, show them an easy way into to win. And, and uh, by this collaboration, you, you, you sort of carry them through uh, becoming a professional industrial player and, and ending up in having a prototype that needs to be tested, whether it's a wind or, or, or on the pictures here, wave or, or photovoltaic or, or, or thermal uh, solar, all kinds of renewables. You, you, you come to a stage where you have a prototype and you need to convince people that you need uh, money or, or you need a... Uh, other things to 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 go live uh, and uh, and in order to do that you you, you need proper testing and uh, by having proper testing uh, you you need you, you also need to renew your testing facilities and uh, by having an up totally updated test uh, center in our case uh, unfortunately only on small wind but um, Small wind is, is actually what attracts us because it, it attract, attracts uh, newcomers that want to get on board in renewables. Uh, nobody starts out as, as Vestas and it's very, very difficult. You need a state program or something in order to, to finance, to build a, a 10 or 12 megawatt uh, wind turbine today. But uh, many, many, uh, many people can see their way into wind by, by entering small wind. And, uh, and uh, therefore, we, we are still attracted to small wind. And uh, so you, sh you should stay updated by following our, our small wind test site on uh, smallwind.dk or smallwind.eu. So then. And uh, another part of uh, building knowledge is to share it. So uh, now we are in a webinar form, but uh, we, we are quite famous also for organizing uh, um, physical conferences, which are not simple conferences that you have in a usual hotel, uh, yeah, as we all have attended. It's uh, it's a different setup. We have, of course, the, the theoretical part, but we have also a lot of uh, field trips. So we see these installations, we see how do they work, because we are lucky enough to have uh, most of the renewable energy technologies at about one hour from the center. So we can see them in operation and we can hear from the operators what are the good things, what are the bad things, what should be done better, and so, so forth. And then we also produce some uh, more, um, yeah, some material that's more addressed to the general public. And here you can see some of our works. In the, the catalog of small wind turbines is actually a way to for, for people to see what is the small wind industry looking like? Because as Tony said, uh, we are looking at big wind, that's good, but we shouldn't forget that there is also small wind and that many of the small companies, private consumers will be interested in those solutions because they are more fitting their investment capabilities and their, their interest. 
So we have been compiling this catalog for several years now, and we are currently working on the latest edition. And in there, you can see from all over the world, uh, the manufacturers with, then you can compare them and see what's easiest uh, and more, more suitable for the needs of a person. But if there is a, something that has really changed people's lives, I would say it's the training program. And here you can see some pictures of the activities. And the, the lucky thing that we have is that besides the technical knowledge, we have also a setup, which is, uh, as you have seen from the previous slides, we are in the middle of the countryside, meaning that people that come here, they are also living here. And that increases socialization and that increases also the possibility of interact and be transversal with different technologies. And then uh, this teamwork gets, uh, gets spicy up by, by the installations that we have because uh, trainees are welcome to, to play on these installations and uh, make studies on that. And actually we have several of the trainee reports which are focused on uh, for example, on indoor climates of the passive house or how to build sustainable or how to make something uh, related to wind and so on. And this, when we look at on the single training, maybe it's not changing much, but when we look at the overall impact of this, now we can see in the picture, uh, the bottom left picture here, we have Ibrahim who has just talked and he has also been a trainee Volker Center. And now he has founded Mali Folke Center. So the impact that th his period here has been uh, has been really impressive. And so to talk uh, also Jose has been very close to us. And then we have uh, here holding a PV panel that's found from Myanmar. He came here, he didn't know much about solar panels and now he's taking a PhD uh, on uh, rural uh, electrification in Myanmar. So this, this uh, interaction allows for people to discover more their interest and to interact with other people as well because as i was mentioning before if we just look at the last five years where i've been in Volker center these are the green countries are those that have been uh, sending trainees uh, in this period and in this time also the number of Volker centers started to grow so we can see that this network is keeping on building up and that's a very good signal Something that we have learned now is, is that uh, people are curious and they sometimes don't know what they want to learn about. Because if we take some people from, uh, from Africa, they, they generally want to learn about solar. But then they realize that maybe in their area there is also good wind possibilities. And maybe it's easier for them to access wind. So they suddenly start to, to investigate and to get into that sector, for example. And then on the downside, what we have learned is also that it's getting harder and harder to travel. And it might seem mm, difficult to say, but that's our experience. The trainees that came in the old days, let's say, they would stay up to one year. Now that's not possible anymore. Now all the trainees that are coming outside Europe, they have basically the tourist visa. So three months, no more. And it's not only the, the time that they can be here, which is limited, it's also how hard it is to get them here. We had a trainee from Pakistan, which we had to wait one year and a half to get him on board. And that you can imagine that that's a really big problem. So to get back to the World Wind Energy Institute, which we are also part of, uh, it's great that this collaboration keeps on going. It's great that we start a talk on that, but we should also look what didn't go uh, in the previous edition, why why is the World Wind Energy Institute not running in this moment? And one of the issues is the visa problem that has been already at that time and it became harder and harder. So uh, some of the previous speakers mentioned about the importance of involving policymakers, and I fully agree because the visa issue is something that we can cover with that. Uh, otherwise, we have been uh, active in uh, in Africa. Uh, we have these three projects that are running in which we are distance helpers. So we go there for some meetings, but we don't have much more interaction than that. And the problem is that for some courses like the sun generator or the LED technology that uh, we have de developing this, this knowledge, we need people to be here or we need to be there as well. That, that's also an option. 
but that's more complicated to realize usually. So uh, the concept for us is that we should train the trainer. And then, for example, if we take the LED codes, we can have one person coming here, and then this person can run several workshops and teach people how to build these devices, which are not so complicated to build. So at the end, the impact can be very, very high for just one person being sent here. And therefore, we were ready for that, and we were we planned two uh, courses, which were supposed to be taken in taken place in March. But then, due to COVID, then all this got cancelled, of course, and it does not got cancelled for this year. Chances are that it got cancelled for the next couple of years because we don't know what travel restrictions are, and we we know that it will take a lot of time for the visas. So. So we are kind of in a standby with this. What we have been doing so far, it's uh, going a little bit more local and having, we just run a workshop on how to build a tiny house with sustainable materials. And we got a very good participation that shows that also a lot of people is interested in this. Also people who are not working in the renewable energy field. And what we are planning now for February is to have a, a workshop on how to build a small wind turbine to get people started and to see to see if this can take further. And uh, if some of you is interested, we will have uh, uh, um, uh, our fault international conference on small and wind energy, uh, which we will be taking place at the end of November. And we wanted to have it uh, physical, but uh, it will be online for sure. And physical will depend on, on the current situation. Anyway, uh, this was uh, all, the, all what we wanted to share with you. We would like to thank you for the attention and you can find the contacts in the slide. Yeah, thanks so much to Daniele and Tony. That was great and I think uh, to the, what makes the focus center indeed special and different from others is you mentioned the social and cultural aspects which are covered. And that's, I think, what how you, by, by being a meeting point for people from around the world, um, you manage to bring these people and that they bring it back and uh, um, not just uh, one way, but they can, like uh, Ibrahim, I think you can confirm that you learn something that you then applied in your own environment. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, again, also uh, good to hear you're also interested in, of course, in, in extending the collaboration. Um, now we have a few minutes left and I'd like to ask uh, some of our uh, speakers to make a few comments on what they heard. And I would like, of course, uh, Rana Singh from UNIDO. Rana, you are with us still, and uh, can you make some comments on what are your um, impressions after now these almost three hours? Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, it was a very lively discussion, and uh, we could see different kind of experiences coming from academia to to industry to the research center. Uh, actually, uh, there are so many things uh, which goes in line with what we are thinking about expanding renewable energy and the community services uh, in many of the countries. So if we club together, for instance, if UNIDO will take some kind of initiative, how to fast track this kind of collaboration or uh, visualize countries interest in a club uh, in certain region of the world, and then also reach to the like-minded partner who may have uh, input uh, in terms of uh, technology, in terms of research, in terms of uh, academic uh, strength to contribute in the expansion of this kind of activity. It will definitely uh, result into a very good um, achievements, yeah. So I think today what we saw in uh, our discussion and presentation, uh, different spices are there. Now it is our time to really make a good dish. So I'm very happy to, to, to hear uh, so many different kind of uh, knowledge sharing and, and potential contributors for the future. Thank you so much. Now, if I may ask our Chinese friends, Professor He, I don't know whether you can hear me now, or Professor Liu, 
Um, you also started uh, a couple of years back saying that we need more international collaboration. Um, what's your, what are your thoughts now after listening to all our colleagues? I, I, maybe Professor Hur uh, should, is there? Yet? Okay, but uh, I, I think uh, for me, it's really, uh, really, uh, uh, it's a long time expectations for such a, a, a meeting. So actually, when I met Kala Osam many years ago in, in Kingston, you know, and uh, and uh, also my God, and uh, and uh, in, in China, we we in the past fifteen years, we just develop our um, education program very fast with the help of. Uh, the international uh, friends and uh, organizations. So we should thank for that. And now it's time for us to give the, uh, for example, contributions. For example, we, we have the ability to, to train and educate the, uh, all, a lot of um, our, uh, many of the students from Africa and uh, even from Europe. So for example, I have a PhD student from uh, uh, Ukraine and from Pakistan, you know, a lot of countries. So, <laughs> so it's time. It's time to, but uh, I think we uh, the, the WWEA and other uh, UNIDO and uh, world organizations. You just have very good um, position, and uh, we expect that um, we need your leadership in, to coordinate all these activities to to bring all the resources together <laughs> to promote uh, the, the wind. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. You. Is there anybody else who would like to make some, um, I'd like before Osman Benchik once again, and then Peter Ray to close our meeting. But is there anybody else who would now like to raise their hand? I can see uh, when, when Osman. You... Stefan, I mean... so, Stefan. Yes, if I, I think I, I can hear Jose, Ibrahim and uh, Galal, Osman. So if I can start with Ibrahim Togula and then Jose and then Galal, Osman, last. Ibrahim, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Stefan. Uh, I think this has been really a great, uh, great call and uh, discussion. So it was really, uh, Lovely to see so many friends and, uh, uh, you know, with the Corona, we could not travel, but thank God we have these digital possibilities. Thank you, Stefan, from the, your team for putting us together. Uh, I think uh, we'll start with uh, what uh, the Folky Center uh, just mentioned on the presentation, the opportunity to have a training of trainers and uh, training one person today uh, because uh, moving around the world is becoming very challenging and uh, no one know what will be you know from the coming years uh, possibility for moving around and uh, send people here and there there are security restrictions there are health restrictions there are also political restrictions so so if we can have that possibilities and have a kind of some places around the world you know denmark germany china uh, canada and uh, uh, egypt mali to, to really have a possibility to cooperate with UNIDO and uh, cooperate with uh, other, you know, uh, organizations, uh, governments. I think that could be, you know, we have a very, we have all the ingredients. I think I like very much what Rena, uh, Rena from UNIDO said, we have all the spices to have a delicious sauce and uh, which will be, you know, benefited for renewable energy for all of us. So we at the Mali Folk Center and uh, we are very, we'll be very delighted to contribute to work on Sub-Saharan Africa. We are doing something here. We are working with a folk center. And then uh, we work with many of you and then to, to make this a reality on the world because the time is, time is right. Uh, but I will say to be more practical is to have some resource person, you know, a few people to be designated and, you know, and, uh, and to work, to see what they've been working in the past and what was missing. And uh, so we should be operational to put a kind of action plan 
and where everyone has his own and responsibilities and uh, and then to make something concrete you know that's that should be very useful so we are we'd be more than happy to participate in that thank you very much excellent i think these were good points and maybe after last last word uh, osman benji you can say you can directly respond to that uh, jose Echeverri, if you i think you wanted also to say something Yeah, uh, so can you hear me? Yes, you have. So I, um, I, wanna, I wanna celebrate this very epic moment. Um, it's been 14 years, 14 years since I gave you my word that the country where I live called Canada was gonna become uh, a country that you would be proud to call a friend for the world. So I'm about to make the biggest announcement of my career. Um, and I dedicate this moment to Preben Megar um, that uh, guided us for years, all of us, to achieve a replication model, a new set of principles where peace and good government help the entire world to heal, to stop climate change, to stop poverty, and to achieve the sustainable development goals. So I have a big announcement to make. We're creating a new university campus dedicated to sustainability. And I'm uh, trying to stop uh, the virtual background to reveal the grounds of the new Markham York University campus. Um, and here we are on the grounds. Can you see me? Yes. Very good. So you can see our laboratory behind me where yes. the photovoltaic systems are deployed in all the arrangements necessary for success. We have here behind me the Green Life Center that it's uh, dedicated to show how affordable housing can be achieved. And behind me, uh, we have the most affordable housing, most sustainable housing ever built in Canada. Can you see it? Yes. Remember my Chinese colleagues asked me, why don't you have solar buildings? in 2006. Well, now we have them. Uh, you can see affordable housing behind me, the Green Life Center. And here comes an announcement to you, to all of you. Thank you for staying with us for 14 years. We now in Canada have the following things in place. Cold phase out achieved in Ontario. Done. No more coal in Ontario. The entire country of Canada will soon not have coal power ever again. We're replacing it with 100% renewable energy systems. As we promised Herman Scheer, that it's no longer with us, but we remember till this day as one of our solar prophets. And now I'm gonna show you the site of the future campus of uh, York University which we're gonna dedicate with the International Renewable Energy Academy to train with all the colleagues that are here uh, with us today. And it's just down there. And world needs to know what we're doing because now uh, we can take an electric vehicle made in California And I'm gonna run to hurry up because I know you need to close this to fund soon. So I'm even running. I can still run even though I'm an old professor and I still run and this is the dream guys. We turn into an electric car that is powered 100% by renewable energy. Already exists. And we're gonna close by me taking you to a new campus where we're gonna build solar residences and more solar buildings because here in this part of the world 
were run by solar now, just like Herman Scheer dream, this perimeter of the city of Markham, Ontario, Canada. It's powered more than 100% by solar energy on a yearly basis. And how did we achieve that was with a feeding tariff program that was emulating the renewable energy programs of Germany that the entire world now needs to adopt because we need new policies. Why we need new policies, fellas, is because ahead of me, there's a diesel bus and that bus should be electric. Why is it not electric? It's because the naysayers of technology are saying that it's not possible. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm on an electric car that looks more like a spaceship rather than a diesel bus. And my house is solar and I have university uh, funded research by the public purse of Canada. Thank you, Canada, for being generous. Uh, we've been able to build solar photovoltaic uh, solar charging stations that have been replicated all over the world, in Algeria, in Chile, and now we're driving. You can see there's still too many combustion engines, but that needs to change, and it will change. Now, the minute the light turns green ahead, and please uh, don't distribute this video. <laughs> I don't want this video because... Uh, I just realized I'm driving with uh, uh, a phone. So I apologize for that. But this is a historic moment because we've worked for since 2006 uh, to show you what we've achieved. Ahead of me, it's the Pan American gym that is the legacy of the Pan American games that we hosted here a few years ago. It's a solar building with 440 kilowatts of photovoltaics. To my right is the first house that had photovoltaics in Markham, and that's 20 years ago. You can see another Tesla ahead of me. And this is uh, the Panam Center. This is where you will exercise. And you see those gray walls? That is a new campus where you will be able to teach very soon. And you see that? That's a YMCA that has 240 kilowatts of PV. So world, this works. We are in a solar neighborhood into the first solar campus built in Canada. And you can see it right there. And I'm gonna get off uh, this electric car. And here we are. The solar buildings are up the road. They exist. We made it possible. The Pan Am uh, gym where you have swimming pools and the most amazing facilities on the world, the roof is full of solar. Everything is solar around us. And here we will build the most advanced solar buildings in the world which are right by the solar buildings of the YMCA. The train arrives there, the airport is just there, and now you can arrive here by train. We made it. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we welcome you Look inside the in this campus, started in 2023. But I start teaching in the campus at Kiel, uh, and I have a site that I want to develop with Folke Center, my good friends from Denmark. I got Primo real estate uh, lab space. I have a solar photovoltaic 25 kilowatt PV uh, lab. We're building a wind facility. I need you, Galal, I need you. My Chinese friends, I need you. My German friends, I need you. It all happened, we made it happen. No coal, carbon taxation, peace and good government. It works, we're doing it right here in this country called Canada. And we welcome you in this campus that we're gonna build right there by 2022. Thank you so much for uh, listening to us. And uh, we do this to honor Previn Megar and Jana Cruz. 
We will dedicate rooms, the biggest auditoriums, we will name uh, after you. So the young people of the present will listen to your lessons and implement the beautiful things that you have shown us in Denmark, which are an example of civility, peace and good government. That's all it matters now. We will solve the climate crisis now by becoming 100% renewable energy people and raising the leaders that will do it in every country of the world. I welcome the world to come to Toronto, Canada, and I'll work with the authorities to guarantee you visas. We will do this in a COVID safe way. Stay tuned, look at the details in LinkedIn. That's where we'll post the next workshops. It's tough for me to say these things, but it took so long, guys. It's working, it is all possible. Don't let anybody tell you it's not true. Proof is right here. 500 kilometers we can go now. So get here, let's travel around, let's do things, let's create a new way of thinking that takes over the world, okay? Thank you so much, Jose. That is a great announcement and we are all very proud of what you have achieved. We're all very proud of what you have achieved. Congratulations. And we look forward to then indeed coming to Canada again. It's been quite some years and uh, we will be back and uh, work all together. Thank you. Wonderful. Best regards to, to Canada. Um, Stefan. Yes. I don't know if uh, this is possible, but I give you two years advance notice, I guess, when the solar building that we're building there to house the brightest minds of the universe to understand how to solve the sustainable development goals. That's what we're here about, okay? This university campus will focus on solving the 17 UNSDGs worldwide. York University is well positioned to do this because we have 178 nationalities amongst our staff, faculty, and student body. We are the lions of Super. the university system. And uh, we invite you to join the lions, York Lions, the Canadian uh, team uh, that will make a difference because we have merged sustainability with health, sport, art, music, everything that matters to the human race, that's your university. We are the university with a heart and we want to dedicate all our research abilities and capabilities to use renewable energy and the other scientifically proven techniques of proper urban planning, um, you know, all the equality strategies, uh, social justice, focus on solving these problems. Enough talk, let's just do it now. And uh, yeah. why not hold the World Wind Energy Association World Conference in this new building? What do you think? The first event of the new campus, your conference. 2023. That's when we have deal. the next accident. Super. Is that a deal? Super, Jose. That's that really deal? great. Well, I, I cannot decide this because it's not me who is it. This will be, but it's, we will discuss this bilaterally. And I oh, think it's certainly a very, I it's invite a very everybody exciting. one way or the other. We have soon the last word from our president. Okay. I'm going to say be. one last thing. <laughs> I Please. invite you all. Uh, Zoom has a really cool function, which is you can lift your arm if you agree. So here is a motion. This is called good governance. I'm uh, the director of the International Renewable Energy Academy. We've been operating for three years and I love it. It's one of the best things that I do. And I extend membership to all my colleagues in this call that know me. If you accept, just say I and we will uh, relaunch IREA in this new building that I just showed you with a solar residence to host you. And you got my word, and I know I keep my word. So just say I, okay, I have WWA Galau, 
Okay. Mr. Singh, just give me a thumbs up. That's all I need as a deal. In Canada, verbal agreements are done like this. So I'm gonna go through the windows. Give me your thumbs up and you're in a part of the academy. Okay, Osman, thank you. Stefan, I didn't see you. Oh, you thumbs up, <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Uh, gentlemen, yeah, I got right there. Uh, Young Lin, thumbs up, thank you. Uh, Yu Liu, thumbs up. Yu Liu, okay, Yu Liu, no. I cannot see everybody, so just send me a quick uh, note in LinkedIn, okay? If you wanna be part of the Academy, I'm inviting you in 2023 to this new solar building to the biggest conference ever done by the human race. We will talk about solutions, we'll showcase your amazing results, and we will show you how beautiful Canada is too, because we'll do it when the weather's nice, and I'll show you the wilderness that it's our new eco campus in Georgian Bay. Excellent. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so thank much, you. Jose. That was, but I cannot conclude this now because actually this was now uh, an excellent uh, um, conclusion. But Gala, it's uh, still up. You still your turn. Yes, it is uh, thirty seconds. Please. There is a lot of courses and a lot of institution around. This carnival of wind energy courses and solar system. I may ask Peter and the association to get a board to accreditation of uh, the material, the quality of the courses, and to get a, a stamp by UEA, like two Nutritionist Iwa stamp. This is material has been approved and has been checked by UEA. And this can generate income to us and give quality for the teaching material because I see around many players and no quality assurance. So if, if you, my colleagues they can approve the idea and we look for a board and then we can generate income and have fees, then it is accreditation for wind energy and renewable energy education by UEA. And then thank you all and I'd like to catch a chance and send also Happy birthday to Braben for 85 years and um, to, to Yana and all, all the colleagues. Thank you. Uh, Galal, Galal. Yes. So here is a quick idea to make sure that your idea becomes a reality right away. Uh, we've created a brand new journal that will be the most uh, important peer review journal. You know, we have waited too long for information to be published in a reputable source. Uh, so we got tired of waiting and we created a new one. Uh, and some of you probably are in the editorial board. Anyways, long story short, uh, I have the prerogative as a member of the editorial board to actually write uh, an issue. Uh, obviously propose it, uh, but I can publish myself. So I wanna co-publish with all of you in this call and Galal, you as the principal uh, author, because uh, you're one of most esteemed professors in the world. Uh, Egypt has known about solar energy for thousands of years. Uh, and you're one of the most esteemed professors in Egypt. So if you co-author this with me, uh, some of the best authors of the world, this has to be the definitive piece uh, on the uh, roadmap for a solar world. As you can see, We've done it here in uh, Canada. We if understand I, how to Jose, do it. Just in the interest of time, if you can discuss this bilaterally, because we are yeah, already- Yeah, but out. now that everybody's in Zoom, it's easy to say, and We are 20 are minutes going? behind schedule uh, and our Chinese to... and Australian colleagues are, are, it's getting late there. Well, I, I apologize, but look, it was 14 years that we've worked for this day. So let's celebrate it. Uh, Galal, uh, you know where to find me. Uh, you like my idea, colleagues from all over the world. I invite you to work with us. We need to seize the scientific disinformation that has contaminated the heads of uh, the decision makers for far too long. Decision makers now need good information. Public universities are funded by the government, so therefore they have the obligation of providing good information. And Stefan, let me remind you that this is being viewed by 
millions of people around the world. Once we post it, this will probably be a Netflix special. But that's for another day. Uh, it's great talking to you all. And uh, I send you my best regards from uh, a place that does not have coal anymore and where we're trying to deal with the pandemic in a humane, humane way because nobody should be left behind. We are all part of one family called Earth. So happy birthday, Preben. This is your present. And to all my colleagues, I bid you adieu. Uh, à la prochaine. C'est un placer être avec vous. Have a nice, great day. And I'll see you here in your house for renewable energy right here in Markham, Ontario, Canada as soon as possible. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Jose. Thanks so much. And now I would uh, hand over Osman Benchik with some final remarks and then ask Peter to close our meeting. Thank Osman. You, uh, thank you very much, Stefan. <clears throat> thanks to all. Uh, thanks to all and uh, well appreciated and all, uh, I mean, the different comments that have been made. Uh, it's very uh, enthusiastic. And just to reassure both uh, Ganal and uh, Ibrahim. Ibrahim, he talked about uh, how to make it uh, sort of coordination, etc. And uh, Ganal as well, who talked about this, uh, let's say, uh, validation of what's happening. So this is the role and uh, this is the objective of the initiative that I have been mentioning since the beginning. And uh, we are not starting from scratch, just to let you know that we are as well in touch with the UN Secretariat in New York, who welcome very much this initiative, UNESCO as well, as there are related to the science, technology and innovation, and this is the heart of the problem. Our friends from UNIDO as well, who are also willing to, within, I mean, the area of their competence, was related to industry also. So this is why we try to, uh, to, to, to see with uh, Stefan how we can make it, let's say, wide and have a, a initiative, which, initiative which is independent, but at the same time linked to governmental and intergovernmental institutions. So this is our aim, this is our objective. Now, how to make it concrete, and you have rightly mentioned this, uh, 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 Ibrahim. So these questions of practical issues will be taken, let's say, in the coming hours, if not uh, days. And uh, we will, as I was mentioning, get back to you certainly on a bilateral uh, discussion to see what could be the role of each within this global initiative. Once again, thank you very much. Thanks, Stefan, for uh, for launching this discussion, which is useful. And just maybe to, to mention something, which is uh, that we are not coming, uh, starting just from scratch. I would like to recall, and uh, Stefan and other friends, Galal as well, uh, Jose and Ibrahim, they know, they have heard about, the, uh, the, the Global Renewable Energy uh, um, uh, program that had been launched uh, uh, 20 years ago, and which was, by the way, subject to a UN resolution. This is something that we have already initiated and we know how to do it. And it was done. Now what we are trying to do in view of the new move, try to make it, let's say, adapted to, to the actual need and make it a global initiative with the blessing of, uh, of uh, uh, some governments. And uh, I'm happy to announce to you that already some governments that are ready to support it. I do believe that China will be with us. I do believe that Egypt will be with us. Mali will be with us. Australia, Canada, and so on. So once again, thank you very much. And you will hear very, very soon uh, from, from our side, just after having a, a debrief and see well, how we can make it either within the World Wind Energy Association on uh, this. We will see. We will see how we can we can make it. Thank you all. Thank thanks to all of you. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you so much, Osman. Now, with uh, I think that is indeed uh, um, 
explaining the way forward. And this webinar, the purpose has not just been to just meet once and talk, but indeed to continue the process that we have started. Many of us, I mean, some of these uh, uh, processes started 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, that, that is, I think, kind of concluding very well. And then let me hand back over to Peter Ray. Uh, Peter, for your final words, and then uh, saying thank you again and goodbye to our participants. Thank you very much, Stefan and uh, Jean, for the organization of uh, this webinar, which has, I think, been a particularly successful event. And it has thrown out a challenge to WWEA. How can we uh, continue to provide the necessary lead in relation to education and all of the components which have been discussed this evening? It's been an evening in which it's hard to pick out particular aspects without uh, going right through the whole lot. But I do want to mention one thing and to congratulate China. I was in China for, in Beijing at the time that the renewable energy law was being developed and we had meetings to discuss that uh, development. And I'm delighted to see how far what was uh, started at that time has now developed. And I'd like to congratulate China uh, and in particular the Chinese Wind Energy Association uh, for the work that's been done for Goldwind and the work that they've supported. But in, it's hard not to then go on to mention all of the other speakers and what's happening in the other places. But I ask you to just think back. We've had an excellent uh, evening. I wish Canada well with uh, what we've just heard about. And uh, I certainly wish all of you in your various programs a continuing success. The World Wind Energy Association will be proud to have played a part in the development which has been outlined in the education training of people to cater for what is a rapidly growing area of activity. Thank you very much. In conclusion, again, Stefan, John, uh, thank you very much for your organization of this conference. Yeah, thank you, Peter, and for you for staying awake quite uh, late night. I think for you, it's latest uh, time of the day now. Thank you to all the speakers, I, I, to all the partners, Peter. I'll be starting work now on other things because uh, <laughs> the time, uh, it, it just goes on. <laughs> So don't worry about me having you know, had a late night. I'll probably go do another couple of hours yet. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's that's quite impressive. But anyway, also thank you to those who stay after normal office hours, in particular also to China. And uh, as uh, uh, um, Osman mentioned, uh, we will continue working on this. We'll get in touch again. Uh, thanks to everyone and uh, have a great a good evening a good night a great day uh, wherever you are be well thank you for now and goodbye farewell friends <laughs>